This is series three. And this particular, again, is the plague of heresy. 3.2 uh, for chapter 9, 1 to 12. We've already read the scriptural passage. We're not going to do that again tonight. So uh, you can pause the video if you're looking at it on a replay and just read through. You have the Greek on the left and the King James version on the right. And then we have the Orthodox New Testament version. No need to go through that again. We did it on Tuesday. So let's jump right into it. Now we're going to start with a quote from the uh, uh, one of the main, if not the main commentators from the patristic, uh, uh, ancient patristic commentaries we have. St. Andrew of Caesarea. And to start us off, we're looking again at the interpretation from a, not just a um, uh, literal, but a spiritual standpoint. I believe that we must consider, he says, these peculiar locusts, right? Remember the plague is talking about locusts. Let's just jump back real quick and see. Uh, and there was the, the, the key to the pit of the abyss. And he opened the abyss, and the smoke went out of the pit, and the smoke of the burning furnace, etc. And uh, there came out out of the smoke locusts on into the earth, and to them was given authority, as the scorpions of the earth have authority. And it was said to them that they should not injure the grass, of the earth, nor any green thing or tree, except the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. All right, so we can. We, we remember now that scriptural passage, the basic meaning. And so he says that these locusts, these locusts to be the warfare of the malicious demons who always prepare to do battle against the faithful. <clears throat> Many interpreters, past and present, envision all of the heresies and all their consequences as the beastly locusts. That's what we're going to be looking at tonight, the heresies as the locusts, right? For example, the fall of the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, had terrible consequences. Terrible consequences. So we have the heresy and the terrible consequences. These are the locusts that bring about so much destruction to the face of the earth. I'm speaking objectively here, as you will see shortly in the following historical synopses. And he, go, he goes on to say, which I'm not quoting tonight, that, you know, I have no, no bias here. I'm not looking at this, you know, with some kind of passion against uh, any person or any even uh, institution, but we're looking at what has happened objectively through history. So let's listen and see what the elder has to say, who's a brilliant and God-illumined guide uh, in 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 through the scriptures, I mean, just thousands upon thousands of amazing, insightful commentaries on Holy Scripture. Now he's going to look at what happened in the West. Of course, this is this whole talk tonight. If you're interested in going deeper in this, all you have to do is go on go online and find Father Sarah from Rose's Orthodox Survival Course. Father Sarah from Rose's Orthodox Survival Course. You can also go on our Crowdcast cha channel or sign up for Patreon, or go over to orthodoxethos.com. We have a whole uh, series, lecture series, on the survival course, the so-called Orthodox Survival Course by Father Seraphim Rose. What is that? That's an analysis of the last thousand years from the fall of the Pope, the Frankish now dominated papacy in the early uh, 10th, uh, 11th century, so 10 hundreds, they fall away from the Eighth Ecumenical Council, they adopt the Filioque, and they walk away from the communion of the church. These are the Frankish-dominated now papacy. The Roman papacy essentially dies because the Roman papacy was wedded with the Roman Empire, which was in Constantinople. And now we have the end of this unfortunate grave, grave fall uh, and the end of this uh, Roman Orthodox papacy, and they adopt the heresy of the Filioque, and they go on to then birth untold numbers of heresies from the birth from the from the, the womb of the papal protestantism so we have the reform protestantism is created in reaction to the unspeakable abuses that's his words rampant in the west at the time of the 14th 15th century after hundreds of years of being cut off from the communion of the orthodox the one holy catholic apostolic church and flowing, right, creating a reaction to the, to the abuses and flowing from papal Protestantism. 
right? The very the the, the authoritarianism uh, and and all of the the emptying of the Holy Spirit and the life of the Holy Spirit among the very the uh, papal Protestant uh, sectarian minded uh, leaders of uh, of of uh, the Latin uh, heresy, the Latin Church in the West, and so it, it it gives birth to all kinds of heretical teachings, unfortunately. And of course, they don't come back to orthodoxy in their reaction, but they go further away, which is the great great tragedy. And we're partly, of course, uh, responsible as Orthodox at the time that we were not more uh, zealous to return our brothers, uh, especially when they reached out in the 15th century to orthodoxy. So hardly triumphalistic here. God have mercy if we're triumphalistic, we should be in pain of heart and weeping for the state of uh, so many who call upon the name of Christ in the West, which we, again, I think the Orthodox should understand themselves, all of us, as co-responsible because of our lack of mission or lack of love or lack of zeal for the upbuilding of the church and all the rest that we all have to admit we are lacking and that to this very day so uh but the reality is that this is created because of the apostasy uh in the west and and it is a tragedy to think as elder elder Athanasius shares with us just to contemplate that millions upon millions of believers in christ they want to follow him. They, 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 they love the gospel that he teaches. And yet they exist in essentially a collection of communities that are not and do not even have the identity or the marks of the church. They have abandoned the basic marks of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church uh, in the West. And this is the great tragedy. Now, before we just to go further, he says, I want to stop and say a few words about the nature of the church and why it's obvious for anyone, just a cursory review to see all of the various the, the, the Protestant uh, uh, tendencies in the West as being void on an institutional, formal level of the church. So why? Because the church and the priesthood are inseparable. The church and the priesthood are inseparable. Unfortunately, with the devolution and dissolution of the unity of the mysteries and the and the orthodox understanding of salvation and theosis and so much more that is apparent uh, in the first 500 years in such uh, such uh, exchanges as between the east and west as St. Gregory Palamas and Barlam, we see the dissolution in the west of orthodox patristic theology, which is a tragedy with scholasticism and all the rest. So and so this ends up the fruit of all this is unfortunately in the total abandoning of even the institutional marks. And of course, the church is constituted or established by the mystery of the priesthood. The mystery of the priesthood constitutes the church and is in turn constituted by the church. These things are inseparable. Like you cannot imagine the two apart. One is based in the other. It's a mystery of the institution of uh, the day of Pentecost of the church by our Lord. More profoundly, he says, the priesthood authenticates all the mysteries, including the mysteries of the divine Eucharist and the holy baptism, which is performed in the church. I'm stressing and holy baptism because today we have this idea of a baptismal unity, which is which is promoted very much by Vatican II. Another sign of the dissolution of, of patristic theology is this, this innovative Ecclesiology of Vatican II, which promotes this idea of a baptismal unity without it being in the Eucharist, which is, you know, right there, immediately you see the dissolution. How could there be a unity in the baptism and not a unity in the Eucharist, since the Eucharist is the context of the baptism? Baptism leads to the Eucharist. I mean, they're all inseparable. You cannot talk about the body of Christ in pieces and parts and percentages. So uh, it's in the church, he says, that the divine Eucharist and holy baptism are carried out. And of course, threw it in the holy priesthood. The priesthood itself is received within the church and ordination occurs only during the mystery of the divine liturgy. There is no ordination, no priesthood outside of the Eucharistic synaxis. There's no such thing. It does not, cannot exist. All the mysteries, however, are like that. There is no mystery outside the divine Eucharist. Whether it's physically separate by time, it is understood always within the context of the synaxis, and it should be 
I think in our day, absolutely practically united again. Uh, and it will be in due time. Thus, the priesthood and the church are indispensably connected as the priesthood constitutes the church and is itself constituted by the church. Protestantism, reformed in particular, but I would say, this is not the elder speaking, but I would say papal Protestantism is also devoid of the priesthood because there's no such thing as apostolic succession outside of apostolic faith. When they turned their back on the creed, the symbol of faith, therefore turning their back on the ecumenical councils and specifically the ecumenical council under the Patriarch Photos, the eighth ecumenical council, which they recognized for over 200 years. When they turned their back on the councils, the teachings of the councils, the creed, the faith was lost. And therefore, there is no such thing as orthodox priesthood, apostolic succession, without orthodox faith, without the one holy Catholic and apostolic church's faith. These things are all organically linked. Soul and body, mind and heart, the head and the body, these things are organically linked. They cannot be disintegrated. Once they're disintegrated, they're lost. They're pieces that are not make up the whole, right? It's like having body parts and say, I have the body. No, you don't. You cannot have the body without the fullness uh, of the whole body. Uh, so uh, Protestant is dispensed with the mystery of the holy orders, and thus we should not waste any time, he says, even thinking of them as churches. So there's no such thing, even institutionally, even theoretically, even on surface, there's no such thing as a church among the various sectarian Protestant confessions which have abandoned, walked away from the priesthood. But again, that applies also wherever the Orthodox faith has been lost. So he says, do we comprehend, brothers and sisters? He's talking to now the 1980s Greek people in Larissa, right? He's not talking to professors in America. He's not talking to missionaries. I mean, sorry, uh, Orthodox uh, uh, converts. He's talking to Orthodox people in the villages and in the cities and towns around the center of Greece in 1980. And he says, do you comprehend the gravity of this problem, this dilemma that we're talking about? We have millions and millions of people who confess to be Christians and they're not in the church. Of course, it's if you want to define Christian very uh, specifically and not do any damage to it at all, you cannot think of Christians outside the church, right? I mean, where do Christians begin? In the church. Where are they born? In the baptism in the church. When, when does the church begin? On Pentecost. I mean, these things are inseparable. But to use the term, let's say, uh, in a more broader, more lax way, obviously, it's applicable and it's very acceptable to say Christians, in what sense? That they follow and they seek to follow Christ. There's Christians who follow and seek to follow Christ as much as they can. Uh, that's, if we use it in that way, we can, that's okay. That's a, there's, there's a Christians in a, in a broader sense. But can you be a Christian if you don't put on Christ in baptism and in the Eucharist and, in the, and, and, and confess the one faith? strictly speaking, you cannot. Uh, but he uses it in a broader sense, and he says, look at this, there millions upon millions, and they, they're not a part of the one holy Catholic Apostolic Church. They're, 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 they're and if, I mean, what would he say today, even in the 30, 40 years since he spoke, we just continue to have dissolution upon dissolution, right? We have so-called Christians touting uh, the most uh, absurd and anti-evangelical teachings about the human sexuality, about the priesthood. Uh, and so it's just the, the fruits of the apostasy are so blatant and so obvious. How can my all of those who are seeking the truth in the West should immediately go back to church history and just follow the, follow the, 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 the um, back to the roots, right? Follow the line back to the roots and see what happened. It's not today or yesterday. It's way long ago. And he says, all of this, all of this occurred because of the fall of the Pope. And this is exactly what is the consensus of church fathers. Father Sarah Rose, of course, says it, but so does Kobiakov 150 years ago in Russia. He says, the, the Pope was the first Protestant. And in, such, in, in this way, he's showing us that this is where it all began. All of this disintegration in the West began with them. So 
it's, it's a tragedy. We should have pain of heart as the elder does. He says, how will they reach salvation? He says, how will they, what will happen to them? We should be in grave pain of heart. We should be weeping. We should feel the pain of our, for our brothers and sisters who are not in the one church, who are not participating in the mysteries and, and are not on the path, the narrow royal path of salvation. It is a tragedy of untold proportions. And of course, it's not a surprise that all of this has led to the days that the last days that we're living in, which is the uh, approaching the 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 uh, ascent of Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist being so obvious in the world today. He says, I don't think I need to tell you, it should be well known to all of us. In fact, he says, people in that time in Greece, they've learned about this, about the uh, the problem beginning with the Pope from, from grade school. He says in the 80s in Greece, they were teaching kids in third, fourth, fifth, 10th grade, whatever, about all of this history that I'm going to tell you. So it's well known to you that the Roman Frankish church, and I say, I say Frankish here because really, if you go back to history, you see it, everything changes when politically the Franks take over the papacy. Uh, finally, and 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 force the Roman popes who had been resisting it uh, to accept the filioque, that it adulterated the spirit of the gospel. Already, the Franks were heretics. They were already heretics. They'd all fallen, fallen away. They had not accepted the Seventh Ecumenical Council or the Eighth Ecumenical Council under Photius. They fought and warred against the missionaries in the Balkans. They wanted to force the filioque on the Orthodox. Uh, population there that had been missioned. So this is not a surprise. When they took over, it was lights out unless there was going to be return to Romanity, Roman Orthodoxy, and the Confession of Faith. So already in the 11th, 12th century, as Yves Congar says very clearly in one of our in one of his books, uh, after 900 years, which we talk about in our in our podcast here on this channel dedicated to uh, Catholicism. I have a whole section, and there's also excerpts on this channel if you want to go further. But he says a Roman Catholic, Dominican, well-known father of Vatican II says, right there it changed, totally. So the, the, somebody in the ninth century wouldn't have recognized the Western confessions and experience of Christianity in the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries. So already we have an adulterated spirit. They adulterated the spirit of the gospel, changing it, he says, from sacrificial and cross-bearing which the Orthodox Church continues to be, to social, political, I would say also moralistic, a moralism, and a legalism, and economic. It's not difficult to understand. He says the Vatican is an official nation. They have their own bank, right? They have the Bishop of Rome, not only the head of the church, but the head of the state. And in previous centuries, he was considered like the king. So the Bishop of Rome has ecclesial and political authority, a total adulteration of the gospel how can people not see this where does it say in god in the gospel in the church fathers at all in the history of the church that the heads of the local churches the church of rome should also be a political authority that it was imposed during the turkish period on the church was a grave distortion and a tragedy nobody embraced that nobody voluntarily elevated anybody in the orthodox church to be head of state it was imposed upon uh, the church in the Ottoman Empire, but it was freely chosen because of their own theology and their own ideas about the place of the Pope in the West. And this is a grave adulteration. So the consequences of this Western Christian adulteration gave birth to the Renaissance, gave birth to much more, but he talks about the Renaissance here. All of the subsequent uh, dissolution in the West really begins with a dissolution in 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 theology and dogma and then in life during the the years leading up to the renaissance and the and the reformation and the enlightenment and all the rest so gave birth to the renaissance that arose out of the spirit of rebellion against papal protestantism right they were already rebelling before the protestant reformation they're already rebelling against the authoritarianism and the distortion of the gospel the people saw the papal church as a swamp. This is his words, right? Elder Athanasius speaking, not Father Peter. It's this, its decomposition was natural since the church had essentially died, right? Anybody who says, wow, uh, uh, you know, that's a that's a schismatic, a fanatical view. I can hear the papal Protestant uh, 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 defenders and apologists saying, that's a minor view. That's a minority view among the Orthodox. This is Elder Athanasius, a towering figure of patristic theology, 
revered throughout the church in Greece today. And anybody, in, I mean, my professors would sit at his feet. I had a professor of, of scripture that honored and venerated him. So this is not some, you know, I don't know what, a schismatic group or whatever people want to sell it as. This is Elder Athanasius, who's a great and towering figure and will be, I think, glorified eventually. He says it died. And, and really, so does Kangar, if you want to, I mean, not totally, right? He doesn't believe that it died totally, but he's pointing us to a very grave distortion that had already taken place. But he says the church essentially died. This was a swamp. This was a decomposition. This was a dissolution that was going on already in the 13th, 14th, 15th century. The spirit of the Renaissance sought the liberation of the people from the church. You know, that, that oftentimes by papal apologists is saying, well, this is the war and the church, no, this is born outside the, this is the failure of Catholicism. This is a failure of the Latin Frankish experience of Christ. We have to take blame. If we're going to be serious and, and understand that the Lord says, they will know you by your love. You They will understand by your, you know, the grace of God. What is it that brings people on the day of Pentecost or throughout the church history? What is it brings the people to the church? It's the holiness of the church. It's the holiness of the church. So if you have a distortion of falling away of the holiness of the church, right? And and that's going to naturally bring about this kind of this descent into uh, paganism, which was the which was essentially Renaissance. The Renaissance was a return, uh, uh, not not a not a creation, but a rebirth of something that had died before Christ, right? And it's a mimicking of the classical arts and the architecture and all the rest in ancient Greece. It's, it's a desire to get free of this Christianity that they had they had turned on and, it, and learned to hate. And the same elements that, that you know, cre created the Renaissance are the ones who rebelled against the church universally. So this is, this is a, uh, uh, to be honest, we have to be honest that we're, we're, we're responsible, you know, to the degree that, that one, each one is responsible. We have to have pain of heart for the situation and not stand and judge as if this is just a demonically inspired thing that is outside of our, of our witness has nothing to do with our witness. So this was a, this is an attempt to liberate the people and return to worldly politics and classical humanism. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. Papal and reformed Protestants created Christians of this age. It is of course the secularization of Christians that causes all the problems. All of them, including in our day, including among the Orthodox, insofar as the Orthodox participate in the secularization of the church, they are co-responsible, they're co-guilty. We have to turn away from the spirit of this age if we are going to be true Christians. Progressively, he says, Western Christianity has taken steps toward the world and towards secularism, creating Christians of this age and not of the age to come. Christians of this age view the church as a means of good communication, as helpful in developing a strong community, sounds like Masons, right? Or the, as providing a way of enjoying material goods, et cetera, et cetera. Now he's just given a few examples. Uh, we we know the very well that that secularization uh, can exist in a very religious, quote unquote, environment, right? You can be you can be super religious as long as that religious experience is a part of the whole and the whole is not the church, not Christ, not God, but the whole is this world, right? Be as religious as you want, as long as it's just a part of your life, the whole of your life is in this world of this age. And that's exactly what we see. It turns the, the uh, exclusivism, and that's a good thing, right? That we're exclusively Christ, exclusively committed to Christ, in, in, into a part, into a portion of the whole, and 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 they they minimize and and relegate your Christianity to Sunday morning, to certain religious acts that you do, certain homages that you pay. I mean, America, brothers and sisters, and all the Western societies. We have to admit, that's what that is. This is not Christianity. It's not the, the church. This is not. The symphony of Romanity, right? This is not the ideal of the church. This is a a, a caricature of the Christian uh, uh, life and and message and an understanding of of society. All the rest, it's a it's a caricature, and that's what ends up happening in the West. However, the secularization, he says, of Western Christianity has had an adverse reaction in the people themselves. It has incubated ever changing philosophies 
new forms of social conduct and numerous reforms, endless reforms, really, right? Semper reformanda, right? Didn't we talk about that uh, uh, last week? Forever reforming. I mean, that, 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 they're, that they're celebrating that is really what a tragedy. Endless reforms with much unrest that has led, in many cases, to atheism. Of course it's going to lead to atheism. It, it, it makes people sick and tired and dizzy. Uh, and that is, the, that is the fruit of the wars and the, dis, the, the schisms and the disintegration of the Western Christian experience. It's a product of the West. Atheism is clearly a product of the West. It was sent into places like Russia in a boxcar in the middle of the night. That's how it ended up being embraced in the, in the, in the Russian Orthodox West, of course, also through the leaders like Peter the Great, who adopted the Western uh, mentality, oh, absolutely. But ultimately, it came to rule and reign clearly as a missile sent from the West to the East. It did not grow in the villages and among the farmers and among all of these simple peasants in Serbia and Romania and Russia and Greece and all the rest, right? It was, it was an intellectual movement of the West. Marx was in London, right? So we can go on and on. But atheism is, is, is inspired, born, bred, and created and burst upon the world uh, out of this rejection of Christianity, the death of God and all the rest. That's a Western phenomenon, and it's, it's been now made global. So he goes through more. I'm, I'm just selecting aspects of, the, of his lecture. So if you really want to go deep, you've got to get the lecture, uh, the books, uh, Elder Athanas Metilineos, uh, five volume from Zoe Press, Zoe Press, right? Go online and get his five volume uh, series on the book of Revelation. We're looking at, at, at volume three, uh, just to remind everybody who's a new, newcomer, volume three, the seven trumpets and the Antichrist. That's what we're going to be going through as we go forward. So this is an overview of historical events. And why is it? Why, why is it important in, 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 in the context of Revelation 9, 1 to 12? It's to understand the fifth plague from a spiritual viewpoint. That's why we're talking about this. It's, you're going to say, whoa. So he's telling us that the whole Western apostasy is, is a part of this fifth plague. And it's, and it, well, absolutely. It's not outside of history. It's not, it's not, it's not something that's going to come one day. We're living the fifth plague. Like we've been living it for decades and centuries, the fifth plague in this sense of heresy. In James 4, 1, 2, which is, is I'll read that first, and then we'll read uh, why it's applicable uh, here. What causes wars? What causes fighting among you, he says? Is it not your passions that are at war in your members? You desire and do not have, so you kill. And you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. And he goes on, read James chapter four for more. You know, just before we go on, secularism, what is secularism? What is worldliness? What is what is it in one word? It's the passions. It's all, the world is all the passions together. That's what the world is. When you think of worldliness or the world in a pejorative sense, not in God's creation, but in a spiritual sense, what is it? All the passions living for and in, for and in the passions, right? So that's why he says, is it not your passions that are a war in your members? Like giving into your passions and allowing your passions to war against your soul, your mind, your, your own best interest, your salvation, enslaving yourself to your passions. That is the cause of the wars and the infighting and all the rest. So now Elder Athanasius says, well, okay, what's this, how does this work here? Atheism generated atheistic socialist systems, right? Marxism. Uh, uh, capitalism, right? These are also uh, atheistic systems, ultimately. Uh, they're not born out of the, the church. The church doesn't teach and preach capitalism. That's not a Christian gospel, right? Let's not be deluded because we're in the capitalist West and we think it's great. No, it did not. It was not born. It is an ism, and it is out of a secularism and an apostasy, just like the other systems. All right, but so the atheistic social systems with the end result being the full verification of the words of St. James, the brother of the Lord, right? This is what is the fruit of what he's talking about in James 4, 1 to 2. It ends up bringing about atheism. He's speaking about hedonism. Hedonism gives birth to atheism, of course. 
the see the seeking of pleasure above all else my self-interest the individual first and foremost and last and above all else right my will my desires isn't that the vast majority of people in the world today don't we isn't that almost the gospel you know do what you need to do hey at the end of the day it's 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 uh it's a uh, animal you know uh animalistic existence here dog eat dog right get ahead nobody's going to look out for you you do what you got to do to get ahead right isn't that the isn't that the mentality and that where does that come from a total lost a loss of experience and trust in god that's that that is atheism right atheism is a loss and a belief and an experience of a god who is uh, who is providentially caring for you every step of the way if you can't trust it's because you don't know deeply the fa father of all humanity the savior of all humanity the redeemer of all humanity right so it's all connected when you see a, a the seeking of pleasure above all else, me first above all else, this hedonism, it's what we choose, right? He, what is this? It's what, what we choose, what we want. It's my will above all else, right? What we choose to eat and what we want to drink and what we want to hear and what we wish to see and what, how we wish to enjoy ourselves. And you can go on and on and on. That egotism. Is and that hedonism, which comes from that egotism, eventually, right, is what uh, is is Saint James talking about? And of course, that's the that's the uh, the environment in which atheism is birthed, and that comes about because of the apostasy of Christians from Christ. So that, that wouldn't happen if there was an ascetic ethos and examples like there was throughout church history, amazing examples that brought people back again and again to the cross as as the only way to be free and to be uh, to be secure, ultimately, uh, without that, then we 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 devolve back to the kind of hedonism and paganism and the dog eat dog world that we live in today, right? So let's look now at another aspect of this uh, spread of uh, heresies throughout the world, the spread of the fifth plague. And an analysis of the European colonization of millions upon millions of people around the world, right? This is a spiritual analysis. This is a really, really important and interesting. And by the way, if you're interested in this, I actually have a little book on this topic. We're going to talk about the, the 20th and 19th century uh, explosion of mission by the Protestant, uh, uh, mainly Protestant uh, sectarians around the world, which was unprecedented in terms of just size and scope, right? And yet it was closely connected to colonization. He says, millions of people sigh and grumble under the heavy yoke of colonist Europe. When the missionaries of Europe, this is what this whole book is about right here, you can get it from Uncombound Press, missionary origins of modern ecumenism, it's all connected to the apostasy of our day, it birthed modern ecumenism. And listen to what he's talking about now. This is very important to understand the modern world. How did we get to a globalization? How do we get to a global culture, a one world society and culture? It was because of the colonists and the missionaries who went and taught and preached and taught among all the natives around the world, the English language and the Western culture and brought them into the sphere of the Western influence. Uh, which was which was the aim of the colonists, right? To use religion as a as a tool to control the masses. When the missionaries of Europe went to spread the gospel, would they have been accepted like those genuine missionaries who did not display such pretenses? In other words, he's saying they failed because they were not genuine apostolic missionaries of days ago, and in the Orthodox Church, what we see up to this day, we don't we we see a general rejection among the third world of uh, true Christianity, right? A distortion and perversion over the last 200 years since they were uh, accepting. Of course, there are exceptions. Of course, there are exceptions. Of course, there are probably many more exceptions among uh, the poor uh, uh, of the third, third world, so-called third world, than the first world, because here we have gross materialism and uh, the humility and, and poverty is lends itself to the gospel of Jesus Christ in whatever form they hear it. But 
For truly behind their missionary Christian activity was an agenda of real estate possession through colonization. We have to be honest. This is what happened. This is not a woke academic from New York talking. This is Elder Athanasi Dineo saying that's what is reality. Colonization did this, right? Didn't bring about the Christianization of the world, which is precisely why there were adverse re reactions to these missionaries. The end result of a cosmopolitan secularized Christianity, a Christianity we use as bait for the hook of selfish material interest and hedonistic pursuits is atheism. Global atheism grew up again from the West. It spread through the West. Where are all the atheist centers in the world? It's in Europe, UK, America, right? The heart of Western Christianity, Europe, UK, America, the various European Protestant and, and Papal Protestant uh, uh, societies, they gave birth to atheism and they spread it around the world because that's the end result of a secularized Christianity. It's atheism. It's rejection of Christ. Again, he uh, Nietzsche was basically just telling you what was going on at the time. I mean, he was also a prophet and he was deluded, but he said a truth when he said God is dead. What does that mean? God is dead in the hearts and the lives of the people of Europe already from the late 19th century. Going on with Elder Athanasius, everything happened the way it did because Europe desired to live lavishly and materialistically. Europe did not have the Christian frame of mind necessary for bringing the message of the gospel to Africa, America, and the Far East. And you know, if you go to St. Eustine Popovich, you go to St. Nikolai Vilimirovich, you have the same message. This is the consensus of the contemporary saints of our day. This is really not surprising, but it's very powerful coming from Elder Athanasius. And he goes on. What about the French Revolution as an example, right? All the revolutions really could be incorporated, but the French is the most impactive and most destructive. It was the end result of the apostasy of papal and reformed Protestantism. Far from being a seen, and that's how it's seen in the West, as simply a like foreign element that crept up and and warred against the church. It's born and bred within the fabric and the and the and the soil of Western uh, papal and Protestant Christianity. The French Revolution in 1789 has as its main uh, agenda to introduce new initiatives <clears throat> towards organized materialistic and atheistic social systems. Although it declared liberty, equality, and fraternity, these declarations were made in the absence of God. And the end result is all of Europe is governed by the standards of the French Revolution, the consequences of which have become catastrophic. Of course, we know now that the French Revolution was largely carried out by those in the Masonic and uh, Illuminati orders. And it was not at all, uh, it was very well planned. It was very destructive and intentionally so. Uh, and the aim was to begin the destruction of all the Christian monarchy and clearly a demonically inspired uh, movement. And these are the same people who are ruling the elite today. There's nothing, it's only gotten worse and worse over the last 250 years. For he goes on, throughout Europe today, there is no liberty, no equality, and no fraternity, but anarchy, rebellion, ethical deterioration, and the escalation of crime. This was said 40 years ago, how much more today? The Western world, through Western Christianity, has reached these dead ends because it started out on the wrong foot. The Europe of, not of orthodoxy, not of Christianity, but of Charlemagne is what was born. It was the Frankish uh, the sons and daughters of Charlemagne in that Europe, the so-called Holy Roman Empire, which was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, is what we see the fruits of today, right? That's that's the wrong foot he's talking about. That's the soil in which the apostasy and the ultimately the spirit of Antichrist who's coming to rule the world grows out of. It's from there. It's not from the Christian gospel. It's not from the Orthodox uh, Romanity of the Roman Empire. It's not from the missionaries sent from Constantinople, right? This is not foreign to the very heresy it is the plague of heresy. It's the fruit of the plague of heresy and the consequences of heresy. And, and this is what all good-willed, serious, pious, orthodox uh, Roman Catholics and Protestants 
Roman Catholics and Protestants need to come to terms with. It's not the Vatican II. It didn't happen 40 years ago. It didn't happen 300 years ago. It happened from the beginning with the apostasy of the Frankish Pope and the abandonment of the Orthodox faith. This is the beginning of where we're now living, right? It's a long process to bring about the scent of Antichrist. Perhaps now, he says, perhaps now you may understand. Listen to this. Look at this in blue. I got it in blue so you pay special attention. All this evil originated in the Roman church. Now, I, I want to correct that. That's how it's commonly referred to, but it's properly referred to as not the Roman church because the Roman Orthodox church in Rome was the faithful church to the creed, the symbol of faith, the ecumenical councils that all happened in the Roman Empire and the Roman emperor, right? But in fact, what you have is a usurping and a taking over of Rome by the Franks. So it would properly be said something like, you could call it the Frankish church or the heretical Latin Frankish church because she did not maintain the truth of the gospel. And it is precisely why the Pope has been characterized as an antichrist. And that's not just by crazy fundamentalist Protestants, I don't know where, but it's by serious people like Elder Athanasius and St. Eustine Popovich, who said famously, famously, there were three great falls in the history of mankind, Adam, Judas, and the Pope. And this is why. This is the consensus, brothers and sisters, of contemporary saints in our day, and not, of course, unfortunately, our uh, wayward academic and secularized theologians uh, in Western academia among the Orthodox who are going the way of the apostate West, unfortunately. May God cease that process and bring them back to patristic orthodoxy. And going on here, the adulteration of the gospel has led to the Western lifestyle, the Western way of life, right? Of fear, insecurity, and psychological frailty. This is not just an accident, right? This is a way of life that leads to this total disintegration of the human person, right? History has left humanity in today's reality, right? You have to understand history. If you want to understand why we are what we are today, what's going on today, you've got to know history. And not just the last hundred years, the last thousand years at least, right? At least the last thousand years. You've got to understand history. History has left humanity in today's reality the way we know life to be today, right? The adulteration of the gospel in the Christian West, which led to the Renaissance, to revolutions, to colonialism, has in fact led humanity to feelings of insecurity and psychological frailties, to fear, COVIDism, the whole fear that grippled, grappled, grappled the whole world, gripped the whole world, right? The fear and the threat of a nuclear war, or just just today, right? The Russian uh, head of the Russian state, Vladimir Putin, uh, walked away from the uh, treaties. And of course, why did he do that? Because he's threatened by the West, right? We have a threat again of nuclear war, probably worse than ever today. Threat of nuclear war and to all by the, to all uh, the byproducts of what is known as Western civilization or the Western lifestyle. Now, this we're going to talk about civilization momentarily. Very interesting commentary. Another 15 slides. We're going to get into the question of civilization. What is civilization? Where does it come from? You're going to be blown away by how deep it goes and how it is it is actually not what you think. It's not what you think. So uh, let's go on to look at, again, other aspects of this plague before we get into the demonic element, which is the next section. Western insecurity and torment is the image of the fifth plague, right? This, what we see in, all around the world now because Western culture has unfortunately spread all around the world and because of technology and the advance of science and all this, they spread it all around the world on the heels of colonialism. And so we say Western insecurity and torment, but it's really global. It's really global. It's affecting all kinds of people insofar as they acquiesce and they abandon the traditional way of life and, the, and especially the Orthodox Christian way of life. They embrace insecurity and they are, they are tormented by the various aspects of modern life. And he says, the reality that the Western lifestyle is an insecure one becomes obvious as we now see Europeans, Americans too, turning to Eastern mystics 
Buddhists, the gurus of Hinduism, the Dalai Lamas, right? Western man's running to the supposed bliss of the West, of the East, the Far East. These gurus and mystics exclaim, you pitiful Europeans ought to relax. You have so many fears. Sit down in the morning and meditate for an hour or two. Loosen up. Release your energy. Do some yoga, right? He didn't say that, but that's what we see all the time. That's why it's so deluded that Orthodox Christians are running to yoga. Please wake up. Flee the Eastern mystic and Eastern pagan religions practices. Flee them. If you, you have no understanding of the roots of these things, please flee them. This is not the orthodox way, right? He goes on, this sudden need for relaxation exists because the man of the West finds himself in a vicious cycle of mental anguish. A lifestyle full of stress, psychosomatic illnesses, feel, feelings of insecurity, the constant fear of nuclear war, and the fact that we live with all of these evils. Of course, you're going to be insecure, fearful, Right, Because of everything that's been created by this civilization, so-called, which is demonic. The demonic element has, lived, has entered in through all of this heretical theory and understanding and experience of uh, and, 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 th and theorization of God. Ultimately, that's once you walk away from the Orthodox faith, confession of faith, the, that, that which was once delivered, and can never be built on and innovated and developed, right? Once you walk away from that, it's a matter of time until you reach atheism. It's it's a it's a beginning of the end. It's a disintegration because you walk away from the truth and the, co the confession of the gospel. You walk away from the Holy Spirit. You walk away from the experience that goes along with that confession of faith. And it's a matter of time until you birth atheism. And that's what this is what we're talking about. It goes way back, folks. You got to go way back to understand what. What? How did we arrive where we arrive today? We could say, he goes on, that the entire description of the plague beginning with the fifth trumpet call, trip, uh, I'm sorry, fifth trumpet call presents a rather good picture of our contemporary reality. Let me say that again. The entire description of the fifth of the plague beginning with the fifth trumpet call, it describes our contemporary reality. Because of the spiritual reality of, of the reign of heresy, right? Wherein people are tormented by the very things that they themselves invented. Human beings invented all of this, right? This modern technology, this modern way of life, nuclear uh, uh, potential, all of this. And it's tormenting us, of course, because the use of it is so distorted, right? Because the understanding of the person has been distorted because the understanding of God has been distorted. It's all connected. It's all connected. And what do we see now? The demonic element now, right? This is very interesting. Listen to this now. The demonic element has entered in on the heels of the fruit of so many centuries of heresy. What is this demonic element? This evil idea, essentially. It's an evil idea from the beginning. What was it? That man can reach theosis, in other words, become gods by grace. That's the true understanding of the doctrine of salvation given by the church and the church fathers in, in, in by, by the Lord himself and in Paul. And it's all partakers of the divine nature, as, as the apostle Peter says in his scriptures, right? That man can reach theosis without God. Of course, we know where that came from, right? We know the origins of that. It's a demonic lie that he's been repeating and whispering again and again and again into the, into the ears and the minds of all those who follow after the passions, that they might believe that they can be gods without God. And even though God wants us to be gods by grace, they want to be God without God, right? The devil propagates. The demonic element within nature. It was the devil who inspired the first created beings with this demonic element, which advocates the evil idea that they can reach theosis. They can reach theosis or deification without God. He implied that they could exist independently, autonomously, the autonomous man, right, today. No need for God, no need for commandments, no need for eternal life. I know that's necessary. He implies this. He teaches it. He, he's like, it's his gospel. 
and they could exist independently of God without God. He actually infected our progenitors with this demonic thought and did so very subtly, right? This, what did he say to Eve? You don't listen to him. He's lying, right? We know that you can do that without him. You don't need him. Become like him. The same demonic hint is constantly and continually whispered to people by the devil, even to this day. And we can see uh, very clearly in transhumanism this exact message, right, from the devil now propagated as the goal of our, our humanity and our, our, our life, right? I just saw somebody sent me an article recently of a young boy, a, a genius, a science genius. And what do they say his goal is in life? To, be, to achieve immortality. You know, transhumanism, achieve, achieve immortality. What delusion, right? What satanic delusion? Young, poor man doesn't understand how he's being played by the devil. So the evil idea that man can reach the oceans without God, the devil propagates the demonic element within nature, right? So I think we have this, we have this twice, don't we? Yeah. All right. So that's a repeated. But... Here you can see a little better, and we got the image of uh, Eve getting whispered to by the serpent, right? That's what the Lord, that's what the elder is talking about. And this constant whispering, this constant uh, and continual uh, uh, propagation by the enemy of our salvation of the great lie. And this is what's entered into our society today. And, the, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. But first of all, we have to understand what is evil, right? Before we go to that, let's talk about evil. The demonic element. What does it mean? Is it is it actually like a thing? Is is evil a thing, or is it something else? Right? Is it is, does evil exist? No, actually, it doesn't exist as an entity. Right? It has no ontological or existential existence. It has no. It's not a being. Right? It's not a thing. It's not. It's not. It's not a creation. What is evil? Let's look at it. what is evil. It's non-existent as an entity. The devil is not an evil creation. God did not create anything evil. Right? There's nothing by nature that's evil. The devil was created as a good angel, but he became evil. And that's really, what does it mean to become evil? Listen to this, very important. Evil has no essence. It is not a universal philosophical principle, contrary to the various philosoph philosophers of the atheist and pagan uh, worlds, then and now, does not have a universal philosophical principle. Listen to what St. Theodicos of Fotikis, there on your left, icon of the saint, says. He says, evil does not exist in nature, nor is one evil by his nature, because God did not create anything evil. Right? So people say, you know, is God the cause of evil? God forbid. Is God the cause or the creator of hell? God forbid. Does he send people to hell? God forbid. He sends his own creation to non-existence or to, or to, or to, well, I mean, how is it possible? Of course he doesn't. Everyone chooses where and how and what they do. It's all a question of the disposition. Listen to what he says now. How does evil manifest? How does it become manifest, right? Because obviously there's people say, well, there's evil in the world. These things are evil. How does that happen? Where? How? It's not that it doesn't, it's not apparent, right? It's not created by God. It doesn't have its own existence, but it's obviously present in the world. How? So evil exists in the disposition of free choice in logical beings. Evil exists in the disposition of free choice in logical beings. Very interesting. From the moment one chooses to do something evil, in other words, contrary to the will of God, right? Evil takes substance. It doesn't exist otherwise. It exists once we give it power and choose it. Evil exists in the free will of man in his disposition. It exists in the free will of man in his disposition. Interesting. And in his actions. Therefore, evil exists only because one wants it to exist. It does not exist independently as an essence, right? So this is extremely important. So much hinges on our understanding of, the, of what's going on in the world, how it's, what it means, why is there evil, why is there bad things in the world, 
These, these are the questions people ask all the time. Why does God allow these things? Why does God cause these things? All this is blasphemy. They don't understand the nature of evil, right? And it is it is why God, the fact that this, this, this is an, a question of one's will and disposition, that is why God tests the will, not just of the first created Adam and Eve, but all of us. But he tested it then, tested the will, do not eat, right, of the tree. That's what he said. He's testing their will. Because only when the will is stabilized, perfected, then the evil will be avoided. And they have to choose God. You have to willfully say, I believe. I let it be blessed. Let it be according to thy word, like the mother of God said. That is essential if good and holiness is going to be embraced and evil is going to be eschewed, right? So it's it exists in the will and the disposition and not in itself. And we see this again and again in the people of God in the Old Testament, that the Lord was testing them just like he tested Adam and Eve, and he tests us again and again throughout the church's history with trials, temptations, and difficulties to see how much we want to be with him in spite of all the all the difficulties. So in the in the desert there in Deuteronomy, we read in 30, 15 to 19, we read the following. See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments. Listen to the verbs here. These verbs are telling us that they're skewing evil and embracing God. What is it? Obeying, walking, loving, keeping. For all of you out there who have embraced a total heretical sociology, which says, I simply say yes, and I'm saved magically. It's over. It's done. I can never be lost. Nonsense. It's walking, keeping, praying. Love in. It's a continuous present, brothers and sisters. You, it's again and again and again, just like we say in the prayers in the church. Again and again, let us pray to the Lord. Again and again, let us go and love the Lord. All throughout our life, to the last breath, we repent continually, nonstop, forever. We're on the path of repentance, keeping the commandments, he says, and his statutes and his ordinances. Then you shall live because you continue in me. Then you shall live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you are entering to take possession of it. But if you use your will, okay, use your will this way and you have life. Now, if you use your will this way, what happens? Evil comes into the world, right? If your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, right? You will not hear. The will is not combined. It's not united to God's will. You turn away. That's what it means to apostatize, right? A heresy is an apostasy. It's a turning away. You turn away. You do not hear. You do not obey. What does it mean to obey? Epakui in Greek. Go under and listen. You're not obeying. You don't listen to your spiritual father. He tells you, do this. Uh, no, I'll do my own thing. You're doing, this is what, you're, what the fruit will be. Listen to what you're going to embrace. When you say no to God, no to his apostles, no to his disciples, no to the spiritual fathers, right? If your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, and we worship mainly the God of our ego, what I want, right? That's the hedonism. That's what we do today. We don't need to create like the pagans did, although they did it essentially the same thing, but they had a objective, like external point of reference to their their hedonism. So worship other gods and serve them. I declare to you this day that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land which you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess, right? The land of promise, you will not live long. You think you can't fall away from God? Right there it says you can. You will not live long if you choose that way. It's a constant, again, a constant presence, right? It's continuous presence. That's the verb. It's not one time. But a, all the rest of our life, we're returning again and again. We're humbling ourselves again and again. We're saying, let it be blessed. Let it be blessed. I don't agree. I don't like it. Let it be blessed. Let it be blessed. That's what's required of us if we're going to be like the mother of God and all the saints, right? 
He says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. This position will choose life that you and your descendants may live. Right? That is all. It's right there. This is the same message, the same testing again and again throughout history. And we have the same problem. So. Evil does not exist. It comes into existence when we choose it, when we embrace it, when we create it, essentially, and we embrace it. Right? And what it is, is a turning away from God. It's a turning away from the light into the darkness. And darkness doesn't exist, right? It's an absence of light. That's evil. It's an absence of God, his presence, his love, his communion, right? So we're free, brothers and sisters. We're free to become a source of the demonic element. It's in our hands. One can create evil in the heart or mind and become a source of the demonic element if one so chooses. This is precisely what the devil does. He pushes man to choose evil. He can't force you. He can't force me. Nope. Not, no one can. Not even God will force us. No one will force us. If we choose evil, it's our choice. We are responsible. If we choose to be disobedient, we are responsible. We have a problem. We have lack of trust. We can't trust. Nobody else's problem. Nobody else's fault. If we walk away from obedience to God, we choose that. We choose the path of evil. And there are many levels, and it's very subtle. Once you get into the spiritual life, you see just how subtle it is. How the movements of the heart and the mind play a role in everything, right? Whether we're faithful or not. When Lucifer fell upon the earth, when he lost his illumination, his very presence provided the option of evil on earth. So when he opened up the door with his first rebellion. He opened up the door, but we had to enter into the door, right? He, he invited us to join him, but we have to agree to, to go and join him. A man has left... The well, and that's the same word as abyss, right? Remember the, the 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 out of the abyss, right? Comes all this locust. He's using the same term here. Uh, the well, because it's a spiritual reality, right? The, the that he's talking about now. He's likening all the locusts and all this to a spiritual reality, which is essentially the heresy and all the consequences, which is atheism, apostasy, and ultimately the rise of antichrist. It's all from the born from the well of the of the Evil disposed, right? It's born out of the well of the, the, the disobedient, heretical, right? The disobedient, proud, right? You think the people who ended up being heretics thought they were heretics? No. They thought they were really bright. They knew it well, right? They know what to do. They don't need anybody else telling them. That's right. They were, they were the super orthodox, except they weren't. They were deluded because they didn't listen. They didn't humble themselves. They didn't listen. They didn't hear. They didn't use their will properly according to the will of God. As man has left the well of his emotions and senses open and unguarded, so much of the spiritual life, brothers and sisters, is what are we doing with our senses? Are we exposing our senses or are we protecting our senses? Most of the book of Unseen Warfare, a lot of it is dedicated to guarding the senses to not allow evil to enter in. So listen carefully. As man has left the well of his emotions and senses open and unguarded, the ruling part of the soul, the noose of man, right? The various names, right? The spirit of man, the heart of man, the noose of man. I mean, these are, there's various ways to describe the spiritual heart of man, the spirit of man, the heart, the noose. The ruling part of the soul becomes inundated with the fumes of evil. What are the fumes of evil? A poorly used and an embrace of rebellion and all the rest. The fumes of evil and thereby darkened. Again, what's darkness? The absence of light. It doesn't exist in itself. It is created by individuals, by you and I. When we turn away and we allow our emotions and our senses to open up and they're not guarded and they receive the suggestions from the enemy, they embrace evil thoughts and they run after the passions and the lowest part of man, the sick man, right? A man has left the well of his subconscious wide open. Every destructive, as man, sorry, as man has left the well of his subconscious wide open, 
every destructive demonic element that surfaces in his life falls in, right? So we open up the soul, we open up the news, we open up our, our inner life to the world of fallenness and the and suggestions of the enemy, suggestions of the demons, the suggestions of a, of a perverse mind. We, we identify with his suggestions. We say, that's me. I embrace those suggestions. I, I identify with those evil things. That's what I want with life, right? We open up, first and foremost, our senses. So if you're sitting in front of the boob tube, if you're sitting in front of the evil images and sounds, you're already susceptible. That's the first task. Turn away from all of the evil in the world, right? You can't live in Christ as long as you're open to all of that. That's why that devil loves modern technology. He can, he can, he can get millions of people with one demonically inspired, uh, uh, you know, act or movie or whatever it is. He can get them all to participate in evil right? and embrace and follow after it and say, yes, that's me. I want that. I live for that, right? What do you think the rise of rationalism, which is the... The, the ground of heresy. All the great heretics were rationalists, right? They, they, they exalted the rational intellect. They loved it. They embraced it. They said, my rational intellect is the highest, the most important. They, they exalted rationalism, and they looked at God through the rationalist prism, which is not possible to understand. You can't put God in your little microscope. You've got to humble yourself and look as a, from the noose, from the spirit of man, you've got to come at it in a totally different way, right? So the rise of rationalism and atheism, they go hand in hand, are representatives of the demonic element of the human subconscious. I'm going to read that again. The rise of rationalism and atheism are representatives of the demonic element. What's the demonic element? Remember, all this lie from the devil, right? To, to, to embrace your uh, his will and his suggestions. The representatives of the demonic element of the human subconscious. Whoa, this is um, amazing. Uh, so he's going to give us an example now, a practical example. The television. Well, today it would probably be a lot more than just the television, right? But that's the classic example. Mass media and all the rest. A Christian household, there are many millions of Christian households who do this, purchases a cable television subscription. They have a television in their house. They have a big screen right in the middle of their living room. It's with the center of all their, their evening uh, you know, life together. What, what would Elder Athanasius say if he saw what technology is given now? You know, everybody, how many houses have like five televisions? Like everybody's got their own television. They can only do that and go watch whatever they want. Endless, endless, endless delusion and endless opening of the senses to demonic. I mean, it's just, it's just phenomenal. I think. It's just, you you know, you have to give it to the enemy. He's brilliant. He is brilliant. And so if we're not, you know, we are naive and we're slow to understand. So we've got to rely all, all on Christ. I We can't do anything without Christ, brothers and sisters. If you're not calling upon Christ continually, Lord Jesus Christ have mercy, you are going to fall. You are going to end up doing things you regret. And you're going to say, oh, the flesh, the flesh is weak. Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak because you don't rely on Christ. We cannot do it alone. We're not, we don't have thousands of years of experience. He's going to, he's going to beat us. We have to turn away, not entertain, not uh, open up, right? Okay, so the Christian household purchases a cable television subscription. There it is. We got, we're paying, you know, 50, 100, $200 a month. This is exciting. This is our, this is the center of our living room, right? Well, with such a stance and frame of mind, it becomes impossible to advise them to not watch television, right? So now you're going to go to church on Sunday and you're going to have a spiritual life. Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. Listen to what he says. Telling people who pay monthly bills to watch television, not to watch it, is like telling people who pay top dollar to enter today's state-of-the-art cinema to watch a film to keep his eyes closed. All right. So you're going to go to a cinema and then you're going to look down at the floor for two hours who's going to do that like no one first of all they're not going to do it they're going to do it they're not going to go there with that goal in mind but if they somehow figure out oh i really shouldn't be watching this it's going to be very difficult to spend two hours without looking up occasionally there's going to be all kinds of sounds and things going on you're going to be curious you're going to open up and you're going to look at it right so 
if you put that thing in the middle of your house, in the middle of your room, in the middle of your life, that's what's going to go. You're going to be open up to that. That's what's that's what's going to be your center, right? If not your center, it's going to be a big part and it's going to suck you in, right? So it's obvious that the well of our senses has been left open to all the darkening fumes and the lingering temptations of the five senses. That's where it all begins. If you don't shut those down, shut those off, you're not going to avoid the demonic element, the delusion of this age. First sight. What happened with Lot's wife? She turned back to look. Don't do that. Turn away from the world. Turn away. Shut it down. Leave it behind. You don't want it. You are opening yourself up to temptation. All these things, and he went on to describe all the the the, the, uh, the bars and the clubs and all this stuff that makes up the quote unquote modern city life or the modern uh, culture. He says all these things serve to darken the mind, to darken the ruling noose, right? The spirit of man, to darken the sun, the, sp the spiritual uh, intellect. And so obviously in this state, what are we going to have? We're going to have societies, people who are full of fear to lose that, right? They're going to be enslaved to that. They're going to be listening to that. They're going to be driven by that. They're going to be open to all the suggestions that are coming through the mass media. They're going to be guided by that. They're going to be brainwashed by that, right? We can see that propaganda, the propaganda, the war propaganda going on right now with Ukraine and Russia. The COVIDism that was going on. Non-stop propaganda through these things. It's just the ultimate extension of what we're talking about here with the opening of the senses to the demonic. You see these societies, he says. Very plainly, one needs only to look Simple reality, not only here in contemporary Greece, but on an international scale. Doubt, pessimism, nihilism, insecurity. Everybody's so insecure. Even Orthodox Christians, so insecure today. The weight of the created universe, all of the fallen world, the weight of it is on us, right? The consequences of this fallenness. All these torment today's man. Do you know that a man who has no faith in God is terrified of the universe? He's terrified of the little microbes, the little bacteria. Look, you saw that during COVID. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. We're terrified. of. I'm going to wash all the paper bags, the plastic bags. This was on display around the world. It was amazing to watch. Lord have mercy. This is what he's saying 40 years ago. You... You, we watched it on display globally. People are terrified. They don't have God, right? He fears that at any moment the sky will crush him or a building, as you see on the left, from the terrible, terrible earthquake in Turkey that just happened. By the way, there have been earthquakes going on for the last two weeks all around the world. I don't know if you've been paying attention. They're not as big and destructive as Turkey, but they're happening pretty regularly all around the world. Interesting. These are part of the prophecies that are going to be fulfilled in our day. Metropolitan Neophilus has talked about this consistently for three to four or five years at least. He's been talking about their earthquakes are coming. The earthquakes are coming. I was just told by an elder. I'm not going to say his name, obviously, but he's a venerable elder. Just talked to him two days ago. And he said, I would, it would not be unreasonable to expect a massive earthquake in California in the near future. Is he a prophet? Is it going to happen? I don't know. I don't know. But that was a pretty amazing statement. I didn't expect to hear from him. And he, I venerate this man as a, as a man of great prayer and ascetic struggle. And so for what it's worth, it's coming. It might not be the next six months or year, but it's a matter of time. We are departing this life, brothers and sisters. It's a very, very short life we live, right? Prepare Remember death and prepare for eternity. That's all that matters at the end of the day. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter where your kids went to school. None of that matters. Only matters, do you have a relationship and faith and trust in the God? Do you have communion with God? Are you in his body? Do you partake of his mysteries? This is what matters. It is a feeling that most of us may not understand this terrifying, the universe terrifying. He's talking to Greeks in Larissa, center of Greece, 1980s. He said, you might not understand this here in Greece. We live a simple life. We're 
agrarian society. We're simple people, right? But many people fear this, not to mention the fear of an unfriendly and polemical universe. Wow. Of course, the mass, the mass majority of people today, perhaps even in Greece today, are fearful, right? Man is afraid of earthquakes, mm -hmm. hurricanes, thunderstorms, tornadoes, we could add, tsunamis, right? Elements which have really lost their balance and rhythm in these last decades and which create an impression of a dangerous and unfriendly universe for today's troubled man. Now, he didn't know about the various technologies that have been created since his day. And there are a lot of speculation today that there's certain there's technology so powerful that it can provoke natural disasters. I don't know. I cannot say yes or no to that, but I hear a lot. And it's really, really troubling. Whether or not, however, it's provoked directly by man or by his sin, you can see, obviously, he said, this is what's going on. We are seeing this more and more. Before any technology was clearly visible, he was saying, we can see this going on. It doesn't matter if it's a direct hit or it's indirect. It's man's apostasy and sin because nothing is an accident in life. This is one of the great departures of man is from the great the feeling of the providence of God in everything that happens. They've departed from the sense that God is in control of every single thing. What did the Lord say? Did he say, uh, I'm in control of the earthquakes? No, he said, the very hair from your head, if it falls, didn't happen without my providence. Do you believe he is the word of truth and everything he says is true? Then you should have no doubt as a Christian that nothing happens. You have nothing to fear whatsoever. All of it is in his providence. He loves you and everything he's allowing to happen in your life is because it's going to purify and deify you if you allow it to be done to you, right? And for you to participate and embrace it with your will, right? You have to want it. It won't be forced upon you. All of these things, he says, right? All of these things we just talked about, the hurricanes, the they torment in a manner of locusts. Here we come back to the fifth plague and the image of the locusts. These, you know, we saw them literally interpreted as kind of like flying machines, right? But now we can see them as all of this swarm of natural disasters and, and sicknesses and viruses and vaccines and all this stuff, right? Obviously, we don't have the trouble understanding what the elders are talking about. We live through it. And we're living through it. They're like locusts, he says. The man who has lost the purpose of his existence, the man who has lost his faith or belief in God, he is tormented by all of this. The man who has not lost his faith in God, he says, let it be blessed. Glory to God. He's in control, right? Even in the midst of the worst torture and temptation. Look at the lives of the saints. Look at the tortures they were put through. Look at the lives of the new martyrs of Russia who would not bow their head to the heresies of the day, the surgeonism and the ecumenism and the communism and the atheism and all the rest, tortured, exiled. Look at them. Did they lose heart? No, because they had within them the spirit of God. So the locusts of fury are already terribly tormenting today's man. This is unbelievably beautiful, insightful, powerful, Commentary from our great elder Athanasios. Another example, another example, which is very obvious, I think, to everybody, but it's good to repeat because there are many who are enslaved to substance abuse, right? And why are they going after the substances and abusing themselves, supposedly getting something out of it? What is it? What do they search for? They're in search for consolation. They're in search for escape from this, this harsh reality, these locusts, right? But they're actually embracing one of the many locusts that are, uh, that are leased upon the world through, again, ultimately heresy, delusion, apostasy. It's what brings about all of this, right? It brings about all of why the church fathers are so adamant that we have to teach and preach against heresy because they knew where it leads, right? If you have a hospital, and the doctor becomes a quack doctor. The head doctor becomes a quack doctor, as happened in 1014 in Rome, 
when the Roman Pope, the Orthodox Roman Pope, embraced the quack doctors from the north with their heresy of a filioque and didn't follow the patristic, hesychistic, hesychastic tradition and the consensus of the Holy Fathers, right? You have this hospital of the church. Now you have a quack doctor. And it, what would you do? Oh, no worries. He's a nice guy. He'll be nice to everybody. He's going to destroy the health of everybody in that hospital. He's going to send people quicker to their grave because he doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know how to heal. He doesn't know. He's going to use everything in the wrong way. He's going to send people to the grave, the spiritual grave, right? So you've got to fight against heresy in your person, in your life, in your prayers, on your knees, because it ultimately leads to the loss of health, psychological, spiritual destruction. It's a loss of the Spirit of God and a loss of all the rest after that, because we are nothing without the Spirit of God. So the basis now, in particular, of drug abuse, again, there are many drugs that are not considered drugs today, sexual promiscuity, fornication, masturbation, sodomy, all of these unnatural sexual acts. These are all examples of substance abuse, right? They're all dopamine to the mind that you want more of to escape from this harsh reality. That's why you go back again and again. All of us go back to these sicknesses of the soul and destruction of the body, which is the temple of God. So the basis of drug abuse is the attempt of today's man to counterbalance depression or sadness. He's running from depression. He's running from fear. He's running from sadness. And he's trying to find something to get him through the day. But there's only one thing that's going to get him through the day, brothers and sisters, and that's God and a relationship with God and communion with God and the grace of God. All the rest is going to throw him further into the pit, the abyss of the evil that he's choosing with his willfulness. The same is true for not just the gross drugs today that destroy so quickly, right? But even cigarette smoking, he says. Even that. It's so people, people say, oh, no big deal. Yes, it is. If you start smoking, he says, even once, you're very more, much more likely to abuse many other substances in your lifetime, including the various sexual substances, right? People who have never tried cigarettes and refuse to, not even once, right? Not even put it in their mouth and tried once will seldom fall victim to drug abuse. You see how it's a slippery slope. You cannot open the door to evil and drug abuse and substance abuse and all the passions. You must, you must fiercely oppose and do violence to those passions if you want to be free. That is, is no, there's no, you take no prisoners spiritually in this realm, right? The person who would not wish to create hedonistic crutches and counterbalances for the bitterness of this life will have the ability to restrain himself. So you've got to first make a decision within yourself. I'm not going to use the crutches of this world to get through my day. I'm not going to take advantage of these false consolations that the world offers. I'm not going to try to, to get a respite from the bitterness of life with more bitterness, but only in God will I find consolation. Only in God. And he wants to console us. He wants to console us with his presence. However, unfortunately, most people today have left their senses. They've opened up their senses, the five senses, free to enjoy every hedonistic element available to them. And therefore, they succumb very easily to every source of pleasure and temptation, and the demonic element enters in to their life. This is the reality. If you want to enjoy the hedonistic element, you are on that path. You've got to, you're going to create mountains of obstacles to the true consolation in God, which is the Spirit of God, which is the presence of God. It is not a mere coincidence that Cain and his descendants originally developed civilization. Now we're moving on to the two paths, all right? We talked about the 
plague of heresy. We talked about the demonic element that has entered into the world through the hedonism and atheism, which is a fruit of heresy. And now we're going to talk about the two paths that are now before all of us and have been since the beginning. From the beginning, with Cain and Abel, we see two paths. And we see the main path that humanity has taken at the end of this world is, of course, the path to building civilization. Civilization. Where does it come from? It comes from Cain and his four children. They created civilization, right? According to Hebraic tradition, his daughter, Cain's daughter, invented the spinning wheel using wool to make threads and clothing. From this, it becomes obvious that the generations of Cain, and this is a very subtle detail that most people do not pay attention to, were primarily preoccupied with the development of civilization. But what is civilization really ultimately? When you see it in the context of paradise, the gospel, eternal life, and through that prism, then you will see what, what it's really all about, building civilization, building the twin towers, building the, the, uh, the various monuments to man's egotism, right? What is it all about? Remember, God had cursed Cain. So he needed to develop something to lighten the burden. He was burdened. We're burdened, right? We're burdened men and women today. We just went through, why are they? Why do you want to lighten your burden with consolations which are dead ends, right? That's what Cain was doing. He's going to lighten his burden. Thus, man became preoccupied with the elements of civilization because the purpose of civilization is to introduce consolation in man's life, false consolation, fake consolation, which does not end in eternal life and communion with God. Very important point here. You will never look at all of the achievements of civilization again in the same way. You will never look at it in the same way once you understand that they're all distractions from communion with God and eternal life. Yes, of course, the elder says, yes, they can lend much to our life in this world, this pilgrimage that we're on. Much has been given. Of course, of course, it's going to be for this fallen world a consolation. And we, to a certain degree, will take advantage of aspects of it. Yes, within limit, right? Give us this day our daily bread, right? To a certain degree, whatever is necessary. Do not take thought, he says. Do not take thought. What? I will provide what you need. So that what you need is within the realm of walking and living through this life. But keep it simple, right? Keep it simple. Otherwise, you are on the verge of losing the eternal perspective, where we're going, the eschatological stance that every Christian has to have. And the grave temptation of the last days, brothers and sisters, is exactly this, that the Christian's gaze will no longer be in heaven, but on earth. They will be earthly men, not heavenly angels, right? Not heavenly men and earthly angels. Not heavenly men but and earthly angels as we, as we speak about the ascetics. But they will be earthly men bound to the earth, bound to consolations of this earth and looking here for utopia, right? That's the spirit of the end times that we're, we're faced right now. We're seeing it all around us. In contrast to Cain and civilizations and false consolations and utopias, we have the descendants of Seth who was born to serve as a replacement for Abel. Of course, Cain killed Abel. Seth took his place. And these are types of Christ, ultimately, right? He'd been killed by Cain, Abel, and Seth took his place and focused on the worship of God, it says in Scripture, and the simplicity of life. We read, to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At the time, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. At the time, at that time, where, when, with Seth and his son, they called upon the name of the Lord. They worshipped him, right? So he trusted in the Lord, it says. He trusted in the Lord. Enoch, or Enosh, Enos in Septuagint, trusted and hoped in the name of the Lord and God. Very different stance in life from Cain. Very different. These are the stance of all the saints. These are the stand, This is the stance of all the Christians, the true Christians, right? They trust in and they hope in the Lord and they call upon his name and they worship him. Two different paths were created right then 
for the rest of humanity up into the last days. The first way of life, Keynes, is far removed from God. Its purpose is to create civilization at an accelerated rate. And now we can't even, it's exponential the, path, the, the rate at, that we see things progressing. Exponential. It's unbelievable with technology what, how quickly we're going to arrive at the inverse of the gospel and utopia supposedly on earth is coming at us very quickly. And it's all in, ador in order to introduce some comfort into the harshness of life. Or, if you're a transhumanist, immortality, which is the gravest of all delusions that anybody could ever utter. Now, as earmarked by the fifth plague, another season has emerged. We're in the midst of it. We're in the fifth plague. This is it. We're living it. Man now desires to satisfy all his senses, to live hedonistically. Man now lives to enjoy happiness. That's the purpose of life after all, isn't it? Happiness. No, it's not. Not at all. That's the heretically, the fruit of heresy is happiness. Happiness meaning an autonomous life in this world where you get your senses, you know, titillated. That's that kind of happiness is not what the gospel bring. What did the gospel bring? Deep joy, but not deep joy alone, but a sorrowful, joyful sorrow or sorrowful joy. Why? Because in the midst of this path and valley of tears, we have our hope and our joy in Christ in the midst of it all and in pain of and love for all of the all of our brethren we have that so it's a it's a we're entering into Lent on Monday we're going to start to hear it in the hymns this joyful sorrow this harmolipi as we say in Greek right it's 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 mixed together and that deep joy but also that pain of heart and love for humanity that's where you begin to come into true life and consolation this superficial, sense-oriented, uh, 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 very, very temporary happiness is an anathema to the Christian. Man now lives to enjoy. Thus, the demonic element has entered his life, his culture, and his civilization. He constrains over an overexerted nature to extract from it as much as he possibly can. He uses chemistry, nuclear energy, all the elements that destroy not only his life, but also his environment. So this is the demonic element in life. Did you hear that? In his life, his culture, civilization, it's to live for this world and this world alone, to enjoy it. Hey, you're only going to live so long. You might as well enjoy it, right? This is all the atheist mantra right the various things we hear from secularized christians whoever came back from the dead to tell us whether it's real you know uh you might as well uh get what you can while you can because we're all going to go into the grave all of this atheist minded heretical thinking is the demonic element right the psalmist says their belly was filled from your hidden things interesting I'm cutting away. There's much more in the, in the actual text of the elder. Highly recommend you go and study it. The psalmist says, their belly was filled from your, in other words, God's hidden things. Interesting. Hidden things. What's that about? Hidden things from God. And their belly was filled. The hidden things of God are the things we search. We search out, right? Oh, modern man does this the most, right? He loves to search the mysteries. What are they doing in Europe there? Trying to figure out, you know, uh, the meaning of life, supposedly, through the various experiments and all this insanity. Right? Going to the, we're going to go into the deep things of God. That's what the transhumanists blaspheme about, right? We're going to figure out, we're going to become gods because we're going to figure out the, uh, the, the key to immortality, right? The depths of the ocean, the depths of the earth, the depths of this, that, and extract, 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 get out everything we can, pull it out of the earth, pull it out of everything, and use it for our consolation in this short, pathetic life, this happiness, right? We create to eat, not to meet our needs, but to fulfill our desires. All about fulfilling the fallen man's desires. We read in Psalm 16, the men of the world are those who are satisfied with uncleanness and fill their belly with thy hidden treasures. 
But I say, says the psalmist, and I shall be satisfied when I look upon thy glory. All right, so you have the two paths very clear, very clearly laid out right there in Psalm 16, Septuagint numbering. The men of the world, again, are satisfied with uncleanness, and they fill their belly with thy hidden things. But the psalmist says, I, that's the faithful Christian, says, I shall be satisfied when I look upon thy glory. I want. I don't want anything from this world. I just want thy glory. I want thee. I want thy uncreated light, thy, the presence of thy of, in my life, thy providence, thy love, the, the, the grace of God, right? So this is the camp of Seth who says that, right? The other camp of Cain says uh, that eats the hidden things is the camp of Cain, right? So he, we see that the man of faith is satisfied and filled with the glory of God, and he cultivates the earth very simply. This is a sign of the times now. Monsanto and all the Bill Gates and all these people who, are, who have turned simple agrarian life into with their technology and their machines and their genetic engineering it is a sign of the times, right? That they are totally apostate and, and they're 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 filling their belly with thy hidden treasures, right? The, the uncleanness of their desires and their and their and their their goals and all the rest, right? But the simple man who fills and cultivates the earth simply, do you have a garden? Do you have gardens? Get a garden, do something, get some chickens, do something. Go back to the simple life. He sees God, the simple one, the camp of Seth, and he is filled. God fills him, right? God fills him. He only takes from nature what is of necessity to him without forcing nature. This is what the Lord meant by saying that man does not live with bread alone. He's filled with God. And he doesn't look to force nature. He doesn't need any of that because he's filled with God. The great emptiness of Western man is what created all the emptiness of modern Western culture. And that is the fruit of heresy. From the moment we believe that man did not live with bread alone, but with the word of God and with the vision of God, balance has been established in the powers of nature. Then the tortures of contemporary civilization that torments today's man will not exist. So what's the key? That we don't live by bread alone. We live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. That means the grace of God. That means the vision of God. We look to have the vision of God, the theoria right? The theosis, the communion, the deep relationship with God, then everything is in balance. When that's lost, everything is lost, and we have only uh, 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 chaos spinning out of control, and there's nothing we can do. It's going to spin out of control until it destroys everything at the end of the world. The demonic element in nature, it's totally uncontrollable. Man has discovered and released the demonic element with the nature, but now he cannot control it. There is no fail-proof method of safety, safely dis disposing of atomic energy, for instance, and to control all the nuclear warheads that threaten humanity. Give an example. That's an obvious example of what this demonic element has now entered. The hidden things that man should not be. The simple life doesn't lead to this, right? The, the faithful life, the God-bearing life, the God godly life does not lead to this reality. It's a result of heresy and apostasy. All of this anguish is part of the fifth plague which comes upon mankind with the trumpet call of the angel and which is especially begun to be filled in our 20th century, now 21st century. The description of this plague ends with this final statement. One woe is past. Behold, still two woes are to come. We are being warned of the coming of two even more terrible plagues. All right, so we're in the middle of this warning. We're in the middle of the, the we can still repent. We can, but... Who's repenting? Where's the repentance? The, the, the elders and the saints are calling out to God, praying for the repentance of mankind to avoid the two following plagues, which are going to be massive war, one of them, right? The next woe, he says, is, is a fierce battle, a terrible war, World War III, that takes place in Mesopotamia, present-day Iraq and Iran, Iran, according to the scriptures, right? The Middle East. The first woe referred to serves as the warning. So we're in the middle of the warning. It's being we're being clear signs all around us that we are on the verge of going into the into this massive destructive war. Uh, 
Two more plagues will follow if we do not repent. Is It is the plague that directs us to repentance. So everything, even this, is, is a call to repentance. Unfortunately, many of our pastors, priests, bishops are not calling along with God the world to repentance. We should be seeing all the signs as leaders of the church. We should be seeing everything around us and saying, repent along with the, the signs and symbols. We should be first. Where are we? Where is the call to repentance from the Christian leaders? We don't, if we don't repent and turn to God, and we have said this before, he says, my friends, two more woes are coming. Will we repent? That's the question. That's the eternal perennial question. I'm sorry, I didn't have that there. That's the question, right? There it is. Will we repent? Will we repent? The plague that directs us to repentance is right upon us, but will we repent? That was 40 years ago. So that's the end of lesson 3.2. I I hope that this has been very beneficial because I was tremendously benefited. I was tremendously benefited by this section, and I wanted to share it with all of you. All right, let's open it up to questions. Referring to the schism, do we accept everything that happens as God's will or permit it? It's not God's will. God does not desire God's will in the sense of his good pleasure. It's never his good pleasure for any evil to come. Obviously, we just went through this whole explanation of where evil is and what it is. So he does not will and does not desire the um, schism or people falling away. God forbid. No. Uh, but he allows it because men choose. Right. And he respects our freedom. And he calls us continually to, to back to repentance again and again and again. And yet we insist, uh, and we have insisted oftentimes, to not repent, not return. What about saints like St. Saint Philaret of Moscow and St. Sophronia of Essex? I heard they said that schism was a wound in the body of Christ. Well, it's a wound when anytime somebody departs from us, of course, we're going to be in pain. Of course. Uh, if, if a husband and wife separate... One walks away, uh, or not even that. Let's just say we're married, right? And um, see if we can give an analogy to help you understand this. It's going to be a wound in the body of Christ. Doesn't mean the body of Christ is broken by it. That means the body of Christ is separated. Can Christ be separated? St. Paul, doesn't he say clearly, is there a separation in the body? Uh, is Christ divided, he says? It's impossible for Christ to be divided. So as St. Justin Povich says many, many times, there's only departure from the church. There's only departure from the church because it cannot be divided. So it's a wound, though. Like it's like a it's like a stab from the devil, right? He's stabbing the church, and unfortunately, he's taking away people from it. And the church is uh, wounded by that. But it doesn't mean that it's divided. That doesn't mean the body. It doesn't mean that those who departed and caused the wound are still a part of the body. If they were still part of the body, it wouldn't be a wound. Would it? Can we differentiate between the plague on the on the will over? Uh, can we differentiate between the plague of the will, maybe, over the work of the devil? No, uh, I'm not sure what you mean. In clarity, in clarity, is the plague a revelation to us through the scriptures? Not at all the prophecy that the devil is still working against us. Ooh, I'm having trouble understanding your question here. In clarity, is the plague a revelation to us? Well, it is in the sense it's a call to repentance. We just saw that through the scriptures, not at all the prophecy that the devil is still working against us. I don't understand your question. I mean, it's it's my fault, obviously. I should understand your question, but I do not understand your question. If you want to rewrite it and submit it again with more explanation, I'll try to answer it at the end, if you're still here tonight. Does the Orthodox Church have an opinion on the prophecy of the popes and that some consider Francis as Peter the Roman. Uh, the Orthodox Church, as far as I know, no saint or no one has ever said that that's a text that they pay attention to or follow or consider. Now, can the demons uh, guess at the future? Yes. Can God allow that to happen? Yes. Uh, are Is the church or church fathers or saints, anybody who studied this period or even become aware of that, embrace that as some God-inspired text? No. I don't know of anybody who's who sees it as um, 
and and anyway does anybody in catholicism think francis is peter the roman i doubt it right isn't peter the roman supposed to be restoring the catholicism i forget the exact prophecy that's how it goes uh, so are the demons the energy of Satan given to him by God then? No, demons are fallen angels. Demons are fallen angels. They went with him in the fall, right? They fell with him. Uh, or does Satan have only his corrupted angelic powers? Corrupted angelic powers. No, Satan and, and the demons are fallen angels. They don't have any power over us. In other words, they can't force us to do anything. They're, they're, the powers available to them are basically of bothering, suggesting, pushing, you know, creating fear and, and enticing and all the rest. That, that is the nature of the spiritual life. But So I'm not sure what you're asking beyond that. Um, God does not you know, support him at all in any of his diabolical work, but he uses him. And his work, he prov he sees how he's going to do it, and he ends up using even the work of the devil if we repent for our salvation. In other words, all things work together for the glory of God for those who love him. Even the work of the enemy can become an opportunity for us to return to God if we want. So the enemy ultimately has no authority over us whatsoever. We give him the authority. We give rights to the enemy by listening to him and following him and embracing what he suggests and imitating him in our in rebellion and all the rest, right? So actually they're, they're powerless if we are in Christ, if we are in God, we have nothing to fear uh, in, in terms of actually getting you know to us, in us, and, 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 and anything like that. Of course, we're on the watch for what, the machinations of the devil that and the and the uh, the the uh, submission of our fellow man and God forbid to uh, us to his will and to his suggestions and his deception. Uh, thank you very much, Herman. Super chat, twelve dollars. It's great. I never even you know I never ask for money, but if you want to support us, it's always welcome. At our work, uh, it's always nice to see people support the work. So thank God. Uh, Next question. Do the strong delusions that God sends people as punishment mean they've already passed the point of no return or to encourage repentance at the very end? How can one repent if strongly deluded? So strong delusions come as a fruit of the will of man and the machinations of the devil, not by the will of God. The will, good pleasure, the katedokian thelima is not God's, obviously, for anyone to be deluded. In fact, his will is that all be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. So the scripture uses a lot of different language. They're called anthropomorphistic language. In other words, they take on the form of men. Like that describes like as if he's a man with passions and all the rest. He's obviously not. So God doesn't get angry, right? We know that, right? So when God, when God um, works, it's always dispassionately, obviously. And um, so... He doesn't, he doesn't send strong delusion. I know scripture speaks like this, but it comes to those who've given rights to the enemy and embraced that which is contrary to God's will to become strongly deluded. But even that, and unto the last moment, can become an opportunity if there's humility for the person to return to God. Because the will, the, ultimately, the image of God is never, ever, ever totally uh, wiped away. It's always, it could be buried, it could be blackened, but it's still there. So there's always an opportunity for that free will to energize, so to speak, and to return. And sometimes people need to go deeper and deeper before they can return. Many, we have many examples of that, right? Say Mary of Egypt, which you're going to sell it. Remember, remember on the what, fifth Sunday or four, fourth Sunday of, uh, of great Lent, fifth Sunday, uh, she was an example of somebody who went deep into sin, right? And deeply repented and became a great um, miracle worker, really, and walked on water. So uh, so in that sense, it, it, all things can work to the salvation of each person, depending on their disposition and whether they listen and, op and obey and humble themselves. Next question. Thank you for the stream, Father. Oh, that's very nice. Gomer gives a super chat of $10. Thank you, very kind. Can a man lose his will when he is possessed by a demon? No, not in the total sense, not in the total sense. What happens is the demon 
if you can imagine this, in a possession, in the possession of a human being, the demon essentially gets into, let's say, let's say that the soul is like a apartment complex of like 10 rooms or six rooms. Okay. And what he does is he barges, he barges in and he takes over like the ground floor and he says, I'm living here. Right? He takes a corner of the soul and he says, you can't evict me. And occasionally what he'll do is he'll start to, he'll, he'll live there. But then he'll occasionally he'll say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to play with this person. I'm going to wreak havoc in this house of the soul. And I'm going to start to twist and turn and speak through it. And I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever I can to destroy the person's life or destroy their soul, which he cannot totally do that. It's not in his power as we see in the, in the, in the story of Job. Uh, but uh, it's a, it, for the, the person that can still desire and oftentimes does, we see that in the life of the Orthodox Church in Greece, for instance, the great elder uh, uh, um, Achilios uh, Savas, Elder Savas, who was a exorcist, who was also prophetic about COVID and, and, and prophetically said that there would become a vaccine which would, which would kill people. Uh, he also was an exorcist. And he said, and he uh, engaged all the time in exorcism and people would flock to him from all over Greece because they were possessed. They knew they were possessed. They were seeking healing. So obviously their will was still with them, right? So they, he, they cannot totally take over the will. They can take part of the soul and like camp out basically like, you know, a squatter, right? And and it's it's the church constantly seeks through exorcisms and, and a whole regiment to free them of that demonic possession. But it's ultimately in God's providence and what he allows for whatever reason. I mean, it's a mystery sometimes. Sometimes people become saved through that that podvig of patience. And and doesn't mean if you have a possession of a, of a demon, doesn't mean absolutely you're condemned to hell. No, it, it's not that straightforward. So anyway, we, we're getting off on a tangent though. But so that's an answer to that question, hopefully. Um, uh, all right, so next question from G, the Greek, 79. Father, if the thousand-year binding of Satan began at Christ's crucifixion and he still continues to be bound, how is he able to deceive and impact so many people on earth? Well, but the, he's not bound, is he? At the end, what does it say? He'll be loose for a time. And how is he loosed? By the apostasy of Christians. Exactly what we said tonight. It's exactly what we talked about tonight. The heresy of of those who call upon Christ, the delusion, the turning away, the embrace ultimately of atheism, you know, the apostasy to the point where now the so-called Christian West is totally apostate, atheist, that now, now we have the fruit of all this, even in transhumanism. Ultimately, it all comes back to the apostasy of the West and the heresy. So that's what looses the demons. Our own coldness, worldliness, apostasy, indifference, we essentially give him the key to get out, right? And that's what's meant by he'll be loose for a time at the end. So insofar as we repent, his power and his time, the time of Antichrist, will be pushed back. And insofar as the apostasy continues and, and increases, so much quicker will he have more power to bring it. He wants to bring about the Antichrist yesterday. 2,000 years ago, he wanted to bring about the Antichrist, right? He's been working, working, working. It's the apostasy of Christians that have opened the door for him to have such a global reach today with all of the inventions that are really oftentimes under his inspiration in order to, for him to mimic the, 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 the Lord and his apostles in the reach of the church. He wants to use all these means so that he can missionize the world, make disciples of, of the Antichrist, have them all worship his Savior, right? He's mimicking Christ in every way to bring about ultimately at the end of time, I he will have his antichrist sit and say, I am the king, I am the savior, I am God. He will say at the end, right? And he'll be worshipped as God by millions and millions of people all over the world. And that's the fruit of the apostasy of Christians. They, we are ultimately responsible for this state of things, right? That's, that's how we should see it. That's how it is. Could the smoke rising that these locusts came from be seen as the smoldering of the fire wrath coming? It is certainly could be seen as the wrath. We've already talked about that last Tuesday, right? But the wrath, 
that comes is not willed by God, but it's a, it's it's a result again of our apostasy and our giving rights to the enemy. So it's one and the same. Like the devil coming in and and bringing about all this is in a way the wrath of God, but it's not God willing and desiring to bring His wrath, but that we have incurred it because of our turning away. I think that's very clear in Scripture. I don't think we need to go again and again and say more or less the same thing. It's another side. So I think we can say wrath, yes. But again, don't understand it as God desiring to destroy his creation. He, cru he was crucified for his creation. He was he, he gave his son for the salvation of his, cre his creation. That's not how it's understood in the patristic teaching, as his desire, his uh, his workings, right? His But it's allowed... Because there's freedom. Freedom is a crucifixion, right? We have to. It's hard for a lot of people to understand why freedom demands that God not force people to love Him, and therefore they're open, as we said earlier, to turn and embrace the demonic element that we see going on in our world today. Where can we find the full icons of the detail icons found on the covers of the Elder Athanasius books? Um, all of those, to my knowledge, are from the. I'm not sure exactly, but I think they're all from the wall paintings at the monastery of, of Dionysiu on Mount Athos. And as I said in an earlier podcast, if you do a search, Dionysiu wall paintings revelation, and you put St. Elizabeth's convent, they have collected those and, and posted them in one article. And you can see the, the majority of them, in any, in any case, online. And that's how you can find those images. From Valencia, I think this is the person who asked before and I couldn't understand the question, or maybe it's a different question now. I don't know. Uh, it looks like a different question. As we struggle and endure, is it equally necessary to use the sciences and apostate ideologies to work help with people to overcome their blindness? Or would you say we should leave this to God and pray? Well, first and foremost, the biggest problem, the greatest need, the, the, the greatest lack among all the Christians of the world is prayer. We do not pray. I was talking to that same elder I mentioned earlier. And he said, all of this is happening because there's no prayer going on. People don't pray. If Christians repented and prayed with tears, you'd see how quickly things would change. So absolutely, that's number one. That God, We need to be called all to repentance and we need to all to pray. I've used this image again. It's so good. I'm going to use it again, again, and again. So forgive me if you've heard it before, but it's good to remember it. Our prayers, or I should say, let's say our sins, first of all, are all of them go into this massive pot that's boiling over that's called all the sin of the world, right? And when it boils over, it creates all these natural disasters and it gives rights to the devils to do whatever they want to do. But our prayers and our virtues and our love, it, all, it essentially counteracts that, right? It, it, it calms down and negates and, 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 and let's say pours cold water into that boiling cauldron of sin, and it doesn't allow it to boil over. So the more we pray, the more we repent, the more we love, the general spiritual atmosphere in the world changes. People are illumined. People are more drawn to Christ, right? That's how we contribute. That's why we have to first be the life and then the words, right? If we don't have the life and we have just words, then we're condemned. I mean, I am risking a lot when I come on this screen and I and I talk and talk and talk because if I don't have the life that I teach, the Lord's going to say at the end, well, you talked a lot about these things, but you didn't do any of it. And that's going to be to my condemnation. So it's much more profitable for all of us to pray. Now, does that mean we don't do everything else? We do the rest. Yes, we do everything we can. And St. Paul says, I do everything that some might be saved, right? We do as much as we can. We struggle that some might be saved. But prayer is at the first. Then secondly, yes, we use, in spite of their, their demonically inspired creation in many cases, unless they're obviously anti-God anti and anti-man, obviously, you know, I mean, this genetic engineering, all that stuff, obviously we're going to avoid all that. But if you're talking about like the technology that enables us to talk right now, obviously we're going to use that. St. Uh, Metropolitan Neophytos says the Internet's going to be the way the Orthodox are going to missionize all around the world. In the, in the days ahead. So we're going to use this against 
the demonically inspired uh, technology. A lot of times, I think, I think personally that a lot of the stuff that we have and use was not inspired by God. Right? Cain, civilization, that mentality inspired most of everything we have today. Right? And it wasn't ultimately for good. Now, people use it for good. But it wasn't the ultimate aim. It wasn't the inspiration for good, right? The devil said, I'm going to create this thing called the internet. I'm going to help create it. I'm going to work with these people to create it, obviously, right? They don't they do not do it. People, human beings do it, right? But they inspire. They, they, they encourage. They, they, uh, they give ideas to those who are susceptible to demonic influence. And, and they said, well, you know what, sir, it's going to be used for good by the Christians. But the vast majority of people in this day and age of apostasy are going to use it for evil. Right. And they're going to end up all these means of, I mean, pornography is going to be at their fingertips. Right. And they're going to be susceptible because they're not going to have a spiritual life. And so he's calculating all this will end up in his favor. Right. So we're going to use it against that. We're going to use it in spite, in spite of all the rest for the salvation of our fellow man. Father Theodore Obrastov, your blessing, Father. The more I behold rebellious mankind, I think that there are themselves the foretold locusts destroying the earth and one another. Your thoughts? Well, insofar as they incarnate the passions, yeah, absolutely. Insofar as they themselves embrace evil and become conduits of evil, of course, yes. But they also are they also are victims of the locusts, right? If you go back to our lecture tonight, you'll see that the locusts aren't identified with the person. The person is made in the image of God, right? So I wouldn't identify with the essence of human beings. That would be awful. But what people become because they embrace evil, they work with, let's say, and they, 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 they're in symphony and synergy with inspiration and the evil, the turning away the darkness. And so therefore they become stumbling blocks and it's a, it's a, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. I think it's it's an important distinction, though, unless we we blaspheme the the creation of God as as essentially bad. I don't think you're saying that, but if our will is to do that of the enemy and to embrace the nothingness and darkness, then of course we're a part of all all of that, and therefore you could say we're like the locusts. Can you describe the connection between the second commandment and God creating man in His image? The connection between the second commandment, obviously the second commandment is of the two, I mean, which commandment, the 10 or the, the two of our Lord, love God with all your soul and mind and the neighbor is yourself. I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the, the neighbor, loving your neighbor as yourself and God creating man in his image. Well, certainly, uh, certainly they're absolutely connected. You can think of the two commandments as a cross. The one is vertical and it connects us to God. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The other is horizontal, and it connects us to all of mankind. And that also connects us to God. In fact, if they're not both present, then we don't have a connection to God, right? Doesn't Saint Paul, the Apostle John say as much? If you say you love your neighbor or love God, but you hate your neighbor, you are a liar. So they're inseparable, like the cross. is. is in, you can't have a cross without both. You can't have a vertical ascent without the horizontal embrace of your fellow man who's in the image of God. So absolutely they're inseparable. And the Lord said as much. And that's why any idea of loving your neighbor and in any way undermining the commandments of God is total anathema. We saw that during COVID. We had Orthodox Christian priests. God helped them and saved them and, and made their prayers save me. But I will say it. And they're, I know them personally, but they said something that's very mistaken. They said, we're going to shut down the churches to love our neighbor. That is nonsense. Nonsense. That's insanity. No, you cannot shut down the churches to love your neighbor. That's exactly what they thought they were doing. Why is that impossible? Because it is a commandment of God to worship him. It is a commandment of God to commune of the mysteries. Is a commandment of God to, 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 to come together in the Eucharistic synaxes as the body of Christ. And without that presence, without that grace, without that connection and communion, we cannot turn and love our neighbor. That's not love, to shut him off from the chalice, from the communion of the brethren, from the worship of God. That's not love. 
I mean, that, that was mind bending. It was, whoa, how did that possibly get said and not understood why that's the demonic inspiration? You cannot love your neighbor if you don't love God, and you cannot love God if you don't love a neighbor. And shutting down the churches, you cannot love God. You cannot love God. Can you be can you be obedient to God? I'm sorry, disobedient to God and love him? Is that what, what does he say? If you do my commandments, then you love me. When you turn away from his commandments, you don't love him. And therefore, you can't love your neighbor. They're absolutely inseparable. So that's so important. So important, so important in our life. The minute we turn away from our neighbor, we don't have pain of heart and love for him. We don't sacrifice for him. We expose ourselves as, as, as not loving God, as not even knowing God, right? If our stance is, 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 is a stance of antagonism. So we show ourselves as strangers to God. God sends rain and sun and all the rest on the just and the unjust alike. And St. Saint Siloan the Athenite says, if you don't love your enemies, you're not a Christian. Your enemies, of course, he's our brother. He's our, he's our the enemies of God, of, of man, of God, all the enemies that stand against us, all these people, including the worst transhumanists, the worst globalists, right? They're all in the image of God, whether they like it or not. And we have to love them and pray for them. We don't do that. I don't do that enough, right? We need to pray for them. And if we truly love them because we see God in them, their image of Christ in them, they're, accorded, they're created according to the image of Christ, just like we are. Uh, and we should weep for them, but we should not do their will. We should work against their will because their will is destruction. Uh, all right, next question. <clears throat> A little water. Uh, my confusion is over evil not being real. No, we didn't say it's not real. So this doesn't have an entity. It doesn't exist as a being, as a creation of God. Does that mean it's not real? It's not. It's like not fake, right? It exists. I mean, you know, you can see the the fruit of it. So it obviously is doing something. It exists, but not as an essence, not as an entity. It doesn't have an ontological existence, right? Just like darkness doesn't exist in its in of itself. When does darkness come about? When light no longer shines, right? So that's how you should understand that. But darkness is real, right? It's not fake. All right, so keep going. Uh, but that Satan and demons being real. Yeah, in fact, it's very clear that that's the case. What do we say in the Lord's Prayer? We don't say, deliver us from evil. Do you say that? If you do, you're not saying the Lord's Prayer. Do you know that? If you say, deliver us from evil at the end of the Lord's Prayer, you are not saying the Lord's Prayer. Why? Because the Greek doesn't say evil. It says evil one. Don boniro, which is a bean, right? Don boniro, the evil one. There is no evil. De say, deliver us from evil is like saying it delivers from darkness or, or non-existence. It's stu it doesn't make sense. And it's not the scriptural passage. It's not what it says in, in the Greek. We is Orthodox must not say that version of the Lord's Prayer. It's the evil one. So they're very real. They're beings. They're created by God. They're not evil in themselves. They're not created evil. They're not, their essence is not evil. They're evil by turning away from God, right? So their power with evil is not real except through our giving it to them. Yes, in a sense, as the elder said, we create it with our choices, with our decisions, with our acquiescence to their suggestions, their de deceptions, their lies. When we acquiesce, when we go along with it, and we could go along with it and acquiesce it for a variety of reasons, also out of ignorance, also out of indifference, right? That's why it's not just a conscious thing. You could, you could, in sense of like intentional, right? There are people doing the will of the enemy, in, uh, not intentionally, but because they're indifferent to the truth, because they're ignorant of the truth, because they don't care about the truth. And they end up doing the will of the enemy. They're pawns, victims, but they're co-responsible because of their lack of love of God and love of the truth. They become co-workers with, with the demons, and therefore they, uh, they work together to manifest the fruit of those demonic suggestions and therefore evil in the world, right? All right, I hopefully answered that. The plague, as you described it today, is it a planned destiny for us or is it the work of the devil? 
Um, it's not destiny. We don't believe in destiny. There's no fate. It doesn't exist. There's no luck. There's no fate. It's it's uh, not planned by God, that's for sure. God doesn't want this to come about, but he foresees it. And he alerts it to a, uh, us to it through the prophets and through the scriptures and through the signs and through the saints and through all of this so that we might not be lost. He's helping us every step of the way if we want it. He gives us saints in our own day, like Elder Ephraim, who, who prophesied these days. He said before his repose, 10, 15 years ago, but after my repose, it's all going to begin, he said. And immediately on his repose, we had the outbreak in Wuhan and all of the house that, that existed. I believe that's a fulfillment of his prophecy. We have many such saints in our day who help us on the path. Uh, and the Lord is doing that. He's helping us every step of the way. So it's not a planned anything because, uh, I mean, certainly the devil plans any, any schemes to bring about all this stuff, but it's the work of the devil uh, and our acquiescence. I want to actually go to the real root of the problem. The apostasy of Christians is the real problem and that brings about and allows the devil to do his thing, right? That's what we have to remember. He's powerless if we don't give him the rights in our life. And a warning, he's, the question goes on. Um, let me read it again. The plague, as you described it today, is it a planned destiny for us or is it the work of the devil and a warning as a revelation through the scriptures? Yes, it's a warning. It, we said at the end, right? He says, the plague that directs us to repentance. So this plague is a warning. It's screaming to us, repent. But will we repent? That's the question. And of course, it's up to each one of us. Like you can't repent for everybody else, but for yourself, you can't. What does repentance mean? Constant reorientation to Christ, putting him always in your life, first and foremost, every day. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy. That's what it means to repent. Be constantly focusing on Christ, his teachings, his words, his will, his desire, his saints, his mysteries, his church at the forefront of everything we do. And then you're on the path repentance reorientation like the prodigal he was running into the embrace of christ right can one distinguish if a man if a person is influenced or possessed by a demon some can some can't depends on spiritual insight and discernment and spiritual experience most i would say today cannot they don't have the gifts to discern there are signs that they could be under the influence of demons and not be possessed. And that's very common, whereas possession is less common, but it does exist for sure. But the demons won't possess for unless they have some really good reason. If they can guide you without possessing, they'll do that. Why, why would they waste their time? Right. And with all the means and everything going on today, there's so much delusion in the world and so much heresy, and new age and delusion that they don't need to go around possessing individuals. They're possessing people, not literally, but essentially guiding and, and directing them through many means and all of the lies and all of the delusion today. Uh, and they're very successful at it. So I don't think I think if, if when in doubt, probably it's a possession, not within, but as a guidance, right? And that's happening all the time. In fact, that's what St. Uh, uh, um, Diabacos says, essentially. Before baptism, that's what's happening, right? The, there's, well, before baptism, he's within, he says, right? Uh, but at, And after baptism, he's guiding from without. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're literally possessing all of the millions of people who are not baptized. It just means they have, they have an ease of access into the thoughts and the minds, right? Because there's no, there's no guardrail, right? There's no... There's no nipsies. There's no watchfulness. The senses are open. When, when we're not trained and we're not given the grace and the tools, our senses are open to the demonic. We don't understand that this is the demonic. We don't have the tools to understand. And so it's easier for people just to follow. Uh, so there's a distinction between possession and following, but sometimes they seem like, wow, that's him. he's so following so much, he looks like he's possessed. Like He's so under the influence of the, of the demonic. Um, so... But you can you can discern it, but most people can't. It's it, it needs a spiritually experienced person. How does one pray effectively or reading prayer book is substantial? Uh, okay, I think you say how does one pray effectively or is reading a prayer book substantial? Well, if you're a beginner, you need to learn how to pray from the saints, and that's why you pick up a prayer book, and that's why you go and you pray the prayers of the saints of the church 
of the liturgical life, you pray them daily, morning and evening. You're going to say the morning prayers. You're going to say the comp line or evening prayers on a daily basis. You learn how to pray. That's half of it is learning how to pray. The other half is actually praying. But over time, it's ideal with a spiritual guide to start praying the Jesus prayer. And the Jesus prayer is something we can have a rule in the morning. We can pray 300 or 600 or 900 or 1,000 or whatever it is that we have a blessing, ideally a blessing, right? If we don't have a spiritual father or we're far from a spiritual father, we can pray, but it needs to be limited and simple and with and probably not at all trying to be in advanced stages, right? We need to begin. All Christians should pray the, should pray the Jesus prayer throughout the day. All Christians should pray the Jesus prayer at least a certain limited amount in the morning. But to to go deep in the Jesus prayer and to start applying refined teachings from the Philokalia, that requires or should require a spiritual guide. Now, the spiritual guide doesn't have to be there next to you on a daily basis, but you need to have access and he needs to show you. You're going to run into all kinds of questions on the road. But um, So I would say a beginner, go to the prayer book for a long time. Begin in a limited way with the mouth, the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Absolutely, all Christians should pray that. And then over time, you need to look for a guide and you need to find somebody who's going to guide you to go deeper. Um, and it could take years. It really depends on you and circumstances and all the rest. But that's that's two words on prayer. Okay. Um, How uh, Tom Petridis, you say we should leave everything to God to find peace, but as a sinner who pushes God away, how can I trust that God will guide me, the sinner, in the right direction? So who do you trust in your life, Tom? You got anybody who trusts? You should have at least one person, right? Are you married? Do you have a wife? How did you come to trust your wife, your mother, your father, if you trust your mother and father? But certainly, in any case, everyone has or should have, I think, in their life, come to a point where they trust a friend, a wife, a mother, a father, right? How did that happen? Through experience together over time. Not immediately, not magically, right? You didn't just wake up and say, I trust you. No, you got to know the person. You saw how they lived. You saw how they were that they were trustworthy. You saw how they loved, and you began to love them, and you began to return the love, and there grew a trust over time. That's exactly what happens with Christ. You love Christ. You trust him over time by knowing him, being with him, and, and sitting at his feet and listening to his words and, and going to his temple and partaking of his mysteries and all the rest that means the Christian life. You have to want that, though. You have to say, I Want, at least you have to say this, I want to want to trust. Please increase my trust. You have to stand and pray and ask him, show me how to walk. Help me to trust you more. That prayer has to go on and has to go on for probably a long time. And not just a week or two and you give up. I've seen this happen again and again. It's unreasonable for us to expect that which we don't give in the least, right? Immediate trust. Do we do that? No, we don't do that. We wait. And, and even after time, we say, oh, what's going on? But this is a perfect God and perfect man. And if you know him, you will trust him. So insofar as you don't, you don't know him. And you need to come to know him. Do you sit at the scriptures and you read them and pour over them? Do you love the writings of the fathers? Do you love the writings of the saints? That's how you come to know Christ. In and through the lives of the saints, you will come to know Christ because of the same Christ, who taught and preached in the gospel, has taught and preached through the saints throughout the ages. The same Christ, same spirit, same church, same body. So sit at their feet, and your trust in Christ will grow. Go run to them. Run to them and ask them, help me. Help me, saints of God. Help me, elders of, of our day. Help me, Saint Joseph, Saint, you know, and on and on and on. Come to love the saints, and you'll, you'll trust Christ, because you'll see how he worked in their lives. And you'll be in awe of what it, what happens when somebody loves Christ with all their heart and soul and mind. Anna D. Diana D. I think that's, yeah. Would we be better off to stay offline if all we use it for is church info and staying informed on world events? No, continue. In a limited, watchful, and very strict way, use the means only for 
growth in God. And thank God there are more and more people using these means for that purpose in the Orthodox Church. And you can avail yourself to them, but not the main part, right? The main part has to be in church, in your prayer corner, right? In your the quiet of your cell. This is secondary. What I'm doing here is at least secondary, right? It can't be the main thing. Like, oh, I'm an Orthodox Christian. You know what I do every week? I go to Father Peter's lectures. No, no, no. No, you're not. You're not an Orthodox Christian. You like to hear things. And I, and I make a big impression on you for some weird reason. So that's not the life in Christ, right? You need to go deeply into prayer. Have a spiritual father. Participate in the mysteries. And then, as a catechetical help and assistance, you go to online lectures. You go to online whatever, right? As far as the news, a limited amount of news, right? Okay, just stay... Find a way to get the news without any of that garbage that's around it, without it coming from the mass media. Find a couple sources you trust and learn the basics. And that's plenty, 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 plenty. Don't do more. Last uh, three questions, and then we're wrapping it up. We're almost out of time. We get a three minute, three hour limit over at orthodoxethos.com. Uh, so we've got another 20 minutes. Would we be better off? Uh, oh, we already did. Is this is John Schultz. Is Cain's lack of commitment to his sacrifices part of the reason why those who chose that path fall into selfish consolations and passions? Of course, his unfaithfulness led him to what he ended up doing. Of course, he chose that. He chose. He looked on his brother. He was jealous. He didn't give glory to God. He didn't humble himself. He chose that infidelity, which then brought about the, the search for consolation, right? The curse didn't come from God as, as if God created the curse and wanted the curse. God forbid. Curse came be, as a fruit and as the direct result of his infidelity, right? And he could have he could have gotten rid of that curse if he returned. And Adam and Eve could have avoided the fall if they said, Evlo Yusum, forgive us. But they didn't. They hid. And then they blamed the other one. They blamed the other one. And they remained in that. They didn't humble themselves. And, and that is the path to, uh, to flee all of this civilization which is headed for destruction, is to return and repent continually. That's the path for freedom from all of this insanity. It's not to become a prepper and fill your house with guns, okay? It's not the path to be free of the coming destruction. Although there are plenty of people who think that's all they got to do, and that's very they're very deluded, right? Uh, it's just, it reminds me of uh, what Father Seraphim Rose said about the super correct, right? There's super correct people on the right, and they're going to be super correct, super correct and everything. And yet they're still going to, he says, uh, bow down and venerate and worship the Antichrist. And why is that? Why? They got it all right. They're doing everything right. They're, you know, they're super correct Orthodox. But that's not the essence of the thing, is it? It's not to be right and correct. That's a disease. To just be right and correct and think that's Orthodoxy. That's a delusion, right? And it's a very strong delusion. And we have to be very careful of that. Right? It's not enough. And just like this idea, like we're going to do externals and we're going to avoid all this stuff. Uh, it's not like that. You can do that. I mean, go, you know, go fill your house with food. That's not a, that's not a bad idea, but that's not going to save you from temptations and destruction. Anyway, you're going to distribute it all to your friends and neighbors when the, when the time comes. So it's not going to save you even from, uh, you know, potentially going hungry. Uh, all right. So next question. What is predestination? Well, I don't know to answer you from the Protestant Calvinist standpoint. I'm not a Calvinist theologian or interested in their theology. In fact, what the little I know, I think it's demonically inspired. Uh, but this idea that God determines from the beginning, before your birth, whether you're going to be in heaven with him or not, whether you're going to be saved or not, he predestines you, he predetermines uh, your ultimate fate, right? And so, um, you know, you basically are already chosen that you're going to be saved and the others are chosen they're going to be lost. That's a total misinterpretation of the Apostle Paul. 
Uh, it's a total misunderstanding of the of the meaning of the words and the and the and the context and the general theology of the church, which would never allow for that interpretation. Uh, which is a tragedy, grave tragedy, that they've fallen into this delusion. Uh, God foreknows, he foresees, he does not predetermine. That would be a denial of people's freedom, which would be a denial of the image, right? The cut, the 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 uh, authority or the power that's given to each human being by God, and God wants them to have that, to choose him. He says again and again, we just read it tonight, choose life, choose life. Well, that means you have that ability, right? You have that in you, and he wants that. That's a part of who you are and how he made you. So you, the idea that he he deprives you of that and the fruit of that is demonically inspired. It's awful. He never does that. God forbid. He works always with the freedom. The mother of God said, let it be according to your word. He, he wanted her to say yes. She had to say yes for the incarnation. That's what he wants. It's not like some he's forced. It's not, it's not a impingement on his sovereignty. It's all, this is all nonsense, legalistic, moralistic, r- r- ridiculous, uh, rationalistic approach to God. So he foreknows, he foresees, he does not predetermine your choices and your and your life. Uh, your thoughts, qu- two more questions. Your thoughts on the tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Ashbury, Kentucky. Well, I'm not God. I can't give you a final judgment, but since you're asking my thoughts, I have to say that I am very, very reticent to embrace it for a variety of reasons. Some of you you heard tonight. Uh, I'm very reticent to embrace it as an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I would encourage everyone to do the same thing. And I would say, wait and see. Of course, God can do whatever he likes in anywhere on the face of the earth. God can inspire people to embrace him. But the problem is the context and the way does not resemble God. Like Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth of Protestant evangelicalism is not the truth of the gospel. It's a distortion, a perversion of falling away. The way in which the prayer and the offering is going on may be very, very heartfelt. It may be very uh, you know, blameless in terms of desire. I have no doubt. But the way of Christ does not resemble the way of evangelicalism as, as seen where? Where's the standard? How do I know? Who am I to say, right? How do I know? What's the standard? The saints. The saints of all the ages are the standard. Christ is the standard in their lives. Christ and they are inseparable. They become the elders at the throne. The ones who worship at the throne, they are the ones who sit on the thrones, a lot the apostles of every age, right? They will sit and they will judge. And all the saints are the criteria, the standard, because Christ lived in them, preached the gospel through them. He, he, he led them and he was with them in their crucifixion and their, and their, uh, uh, their witness uh, of truth and, 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 and God throughout the ages. So we, don't, we have a standard. It's not like we're, oh, I, uh, how can I judge? No, no, no. We have a standard. We always have. That's why the church can say anathema to this heresy. Well, how, the, how can the church fathers dare in council to turn to this group of sincere people at the time, right? The Nestorians or the or the iconoclast, or whatever it is, right? How can he dare to turn to them and say, anathema? How do they dare to do that? Because they, just like in the Acts of the Apostles, said, and how did the apostles dare to say that? Because they said, it seemed good to us, not just to us, and the Holy Spirit. You see how those two are, those two go together. The us are the successors of the apostles who have the same faith and the same life and the Holy Spirit, which inspires and speaks through them and guides them in every age, as promised by our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ, they can speak to the truth of things. And they said, this teaching of yours is inspired by the demons, anathema, right? So we have a standard. We have the ecumenical councils. We have the lives of the saints. We have the writings. So when we come to Ashbury and every Ashbury, we don't sit there and say, oh, who's the judge? I don't know. Well, it could be. It seems good. They're very kind. They're very sincere. There are millions of people who are kind, sincere all over the world, right? That doesn't mean much in terms of whether it's true. 
and whether it's the truth and the life and the way that has been witnessed to for 2,000 years. That's the standard we have to judge it by. Now, does that mean that in spite of whatever problems or limits or delusions that exist already in, in evangelicalism, God can't work with those people? Absolutely, he can work with those people. He can work in spite of it, though. And, it, and he's working in spite of all the delusions. And so not they're not the fruit of those, right? That's what we have to understand. Many people, myself included, I used to go to evangelical, Pentecostal, uh, uh, Roman Catholic gatherings before I became Orthodox. I was sincere. I was offering up prayers. I was looking for God. I was trying to be righteous, trying to be, ju you know, uh, uh, judge righteously and to be righteous and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the things that people want to do. They're sincere. And in spite of all the delusions that I held at the time, God led me out of that and, and showed me his church, his body, the body of Christ, and the truth of the gospel for 2,000 years. The same can happen in and through the, the, the flurry of activity and flurry of desire and flurry of, of goodwill that, that could be happening in Ashbury. But I'm not going to hold a big, uh, as we say in Greek, a big basket, right? It's going to be a small basket because there's so many obstacles that we can see as Orthodox to that being a clear, clearly guiding people to the truth. There's a lot of obstacles. So they're going to have to overcome those obstacles. And in spite of those obstacles, they're going to have to make their way to come back to Christ. Now, again, I don't think we should judge prematurely, ultimately, what God will use and do through whatever is going on in the world, because he's constantly seeking to lead people to the truth. So we should just wait and see, and of itself it will come in due time. Uh, but but it would be it would be premature, it'd be it would be enthusiastic, and it would be um uh without the criteria of the of the of the gospel and the saints to run to conclusions and to be excited and to be. I mean, these things have happened innumerable times, right? And still we're on the path to apostasy, generally speaking, right? So we'll see. Will you ever be doing any talks on the East Coast, Baltimore, D.C. area? Uh, I'm actually going to probably be invited to speak soon in eastern Pennsylvania. I was just called recently, and that might come together, but I don't know when. But if you stay uh, abreast of our work, uh, you might... Uh, uh, you'll see it eventually announced, but it probably won't be till the summer. So he, not far from Baltimore, just up the road there uh, in eastern Pennsylvania, it looks like it might come together. All right. I think that's it. We probably have questions over in Crowdcast. Let me see. No, no questions in Crowdcast tonight. I guess you'll you'll save them up for, for our next meeting over at Crowdcast, all the people who are on Patreon. If you're not a patron, if you're not a part of Crowdcast, you should you should join us every Thursday. We have a question and answer session. It goes to about two to three hours. You can ask any question you want and we'll answer it. And it's uh, pretty much every Thursday. Next Thursday, we're not going to be gathering because it's the first week in Great Lent. And with that, I wish you all a good beginning of the Great Fast. Uh, just to remind everybody, we begin uh, with Forgiveness uh, Vespers. Uh, we ask forgiveness of everyone in our community, in our life. We beg them to pray for us and to forgive us for everything we've done. And uh, then we begin on a fresh new slate of love and communion with all of our brothers and sisters. And then we start the divine services. We have Compline, at least Great Compline, and the Canon every evening for those people in the parishes. In the monasteries will have all the services in the morning and evening. And the Great Canon is so important, so beautiful. Go to the Great Canon every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night in most parishes. You'll hear the great canon of repentance by St. Andrew, which is so beautiful. And then we'll have pre-sanctified liturgy, at least on, on Wednesday in most places. Uh, and then on Friday night in the Greek churches, they'll have the akathist and the canon uh, uh, chanted to the Most Holy Theotokos. And then on Saturday, usually most parishes, you'll have divine liturgy in the morning for the Koliva, the Feast of, uh, uh, of um, and the memorial services, etc., uh, and then the Sunday of Orthodoxy, the first Sunday of Orthodoxy, uh, where we commemorate the restoration of the holy icons and the victory of Orthodoxy over all the heresies throughout the church history. That's the first week coming up. We'll be back again next time, not this Tuesday, but the next, with the next installment of our lessons on the book of Revelation. That's not this Tuesday. We don't have any 
Online activity in the first week of Lent, zero. We're not going to be doing anything, including our posting. Uh, I don't think we'll be doing just very few posts throughout the week, if any. And uh, uh, God willing, all of us on the Orthodox Ethos team will have plenty of time to go and pray and be quiet. It'll be wonderful. You won't hear from us. <laughs> we'll get some rest. But mainly we'll pray. That's the goal. So we'll see you in a week from Tuesday again. God bless you and pray for us. We'll, sit, we'll chant the uh, Troparian for the Holy Cross. If I can find my, where is it? There it is. And then we'll depart. Have a good and glorious struggle during Great Lent. So son kiri et om la on su kev longi son tink lero no mi an su ni kazim pan sin lem si katam var var on doru menos keton son filato. Tia tu stavrusu politevma. Through the prayers of the Holy Father Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. <speaking in Hebrew>
Yeah.